afternoon and uh, greetings from the Asian Confluence and uh, a warm welcome to the first Brahmaputra Erawadi Dialogue. Myanmar and India are civilizational partners with shared bonds of history, culture, and spirituality. For India, Myanmar is India's closest ASEAN neighbor. Myanmar's northern states share long shared borders with India's northeastern states of Manipur, Nagaland, Arunachal Pradesh, and Mizoram. The mighty Brahmaputra, one of the key rivers of India, is a symbol of the northeastern region. And the Erawadi is a symbol of the lives, livelihoods, and culture of Myanmar. Both flow into the Bay of Bengal, our shared bay. Thus, as we slowly ease out of the pandemic, we felt at Asian Confluence and our partners that a dialogue on the name and symbolism attached to the Brahmaputra Erawadi dialogue would be timely to revisit the vision and mission of making our border regions prosperous as part of the overall spectrum of Indo-Myanmar collaborations for a prosperous sub-region in South and Southeast Asia. On my own behalf and on behalf of the Asian Confluence and our partners, the ASEAN India Center, represented here by Dr. Prabir Dey, and the Mandalay Center for East Asian Studies, represented here by Professor Thuta Ong, may I take this opportunity to welcome you all to this dialogue. We are extremely grateful to Dr. Najma Habtullah, the Honorable Governor of Manipur, who have consented to deliver the keynote address. Madam, your presence here shows the commitment of the government of India and the state of Manipur towards the vision of making our regions prosperous with inclusive ecological growth, keeping econo ecological integrity. A very warm welcome to His Excellency Saurabh Kumar, the Ambassador of India to Myanmar, and His Excellency Mong Kuo Ong, Ambassador of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar to India. We really appreciate your presence, sir, and look forward to your inaugural addresses, which I'm sure will enrich us all. A warm welcome to Mr. R.K. Ranjan, Honorable Member of Parliament from Manipur. A special warm welcome to our chairs, Mr. M.P. Bezbarua, Chairman of the Asian Conference Governing Council and Authority on the Northeastern Region, who will be chairing the first session, and Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay, an authority on Myanmar, who will share the, chair the second session. A very, very warm welcome to all our esteemed speakers and panelists from both the sessions and to the audience. Right after this uh, inaugural session, we will have a five minute break after which the technical session will be, uh, will be uh, resumed. So on that note, uh, at the end of the last session, there'll be uh, some question and answers and attendees here are requested to uh, kindly share your uh, questions on the chat box and we'll try to take as many of them as is possible at the discretion of the chair, of course. On that note, uh, and a warm words of welcome from all us, all our behalf, may I now hand it over to the chair of the first session, this inaugural session, Mr. M.P. Bezburya. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Saibha. Uh, it's my privilege, really, to welcome such a distinguished panel of uh, speakers for the inaugural session of our dialogue on you know, this uh, India-Myanmar cooperation for prosperity. We have a person of such eminence as the Honorable Governor of Manipur, Dr. Haptullah. We have experts like Excellencies, Ambassador Saurav Kumar, Ambassador Mok Q. Young, and a respected public leader like uh, Dr. R. K. Ranjan, MP, and all the participants who will be going through these two sessions today. <clears throat> we are actually very keenly waiting to hear the keynote speaker and all the inaugural addresses which will follow. And perhaps it may be redundant for me to say anything at this moment. But uh, we are looking for a vibrant relationship between prosperous and vibrant border India and Myanmar, particularly Northeast India. But I belong to this region of Northeast. I love this region. I feel for it. And I have worked in most parts of the Northeast, almost got killed in Mizoram during the insurgency. And therefore, I thought 
sharing a few brief personal notes would be in order. As has been said, geography has placed us together. Shared history and cultural understanding over the years have emphasized the inevitability of that togetherness. Nothing can change that. Celebrated writer Tant Mian Tiu, in his book, Where China Meets India, while describing his visit to the Northeast, had eloquently summed it up all. He said he felt at home. Time has now come to see how the experience of history, with the experience of history, we can make geography an economic opportunity. Northeast has put a lot of hope and expectation on the government of India's look east and act east policy. I remember not long ago, one former chief minister of Meghalaya in such a conference had famously said, the voice of the people, said that we want the borders to be borders of peace and prosperity, not of conflict, drugs, and desolation. In fact, a lot has happened to bring that dream to, to reality. The communication corridor has been going on smoothly, opening up great opportunities for both these countries and particularly for Northeast and uh, Myanmar. These have to be now transformed into economic corridors with flow of trade and commerce, tourism, people, ideas, investments, and innovations. We can share in all that to make prosperity, something which is achievable. For example, last year, I had the opportunity of visiting Myanmar and discussing extensively as part of an ADB project to create regional tourism cooperation in this region. I was amazed to find that, uh, that we have such vast untapped potential, the jewel of the Buddhist tourism which we can exploit to make a change in our relationship between the tourism of these two countries and economic development. Similarly, I had been, when I was member of the Northeastern Council, I had visited Moray and I was so deeply impressed by seeing that how healthcare, pharmaceuticals are the prime needs of those regions. And there are so tremendous opportunities for collaboration of healthcare, pharmaceuticals, and other areas in those areas to make life better for the people in the border areas, both in Northeast as well as in Myanmar. And uh, a lot has happened naturally, and we'll be hearing about it. Excellencies are here, and we'll have the keynote address of the Honorable Governor. But the feeling is that though quite a lot has happened in Northeast and the uh, on look east and act east policy, it is less than what can really happen. In Asian Confluence, we focus on institutional linkages and the, and the power of the third space, the people, to push people's hours for prosperity and development uh, to, the, to the reality from con conception. We are so glad that in this present effort, the, our dialogue, which we, have, we hope will be the beginning of a new set of dialogues, the ASEAN India Center and Mandalay Forum of East Asian Studies have joined hands with us. We have so many prominent participants and with their inputs, Asian Confluence hope to look, carry forward the masses and to see that they are implemented uh, to make them reality. Uh, I will not take much more time and uh, I would now request uh, the, for the first inaugural address by uh, His Excellency Mr. Sora Kumar, Indian Ambassador to Myanmar. Uh, Excellency, Mr. Sora Kumar. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Her Excellency Dr. Nitma Heptullah, Honorable Governor of uh, Manipur, Sri R. K. Ranjan, Member of Parliament from Manipur, my colleague. His Excellency Mo Chao Ong, uh, Ambassador of Myanmar to India, and my distinguished predecessor, Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay, 
who was the ambassador of India in Myanmar, all other distinguished uh, colleagues, panelists, friends. Uh, I was reading the concept paper uh, when I was approached first uh, for this conference, and I found it very interesting. There is a statement out there talking of Myanmar being the bridge between South Asia and Southeast Asia, and goes on to say that there are people living under this bridge and they tend to get forgotten at times. This got me thinking as to, you know, what I have to say today. And I would come to the bigger projects later on, but let me start with what I saw on the Myanmar side when I traveled to the India-Myanmar border areas and using those examples to convey to you some of the things which government of India is doing out here. And from that, you know, we can learn as to what more can be done from these examples. And of course, the objective of today's exercise is that for us who are in government to get more ideas, to see how we can expand the ambit of the work which is happening between the two uh, uh, countries. So uh, one of the first visits I took after coming out here was to travel to the border areas in Chin State. Uh, uh, and uh, we have a program called the Border Area Development Program, which has been going on for quite some years now. Uh, Government of India commits 5 million US dollars per year uh, per cycle of this program. It is a yearly cycle, though in certain cases, you know, it has not been, it's dragged on for a little bit longer. And the money is used for socioeconomic uh, development programs, primarily in the Chin state of, uh, uh, men, of, of, of uh, uh, th this country and of the Naga uh, self-administered area of Myanmar. And uh, I went there with the uh, Border Affairs Department, which implements this uh, uh, program to inaugurate a bridge. And uh, we did the inauguration of the bridge. And to my mind, you know, it was a good uh, bridge, which would have made the life of the people easier in terms of uh, communication from place A to place B. But the important story out there, which I learned was that as a result of the bridge, the price of rice in that region had come down. And the price of rice in that area it was, is, or rather is, uh, compared to the price of rice in Calais. And it was close to double the price of rice in Calais, the price of rice in this uh, region. And it had come down to almost the same as the price of rice in Calais. Uh, so during the same visit, we went to, uh, we, we, take a, we took a detour from uh, the main road and we traveled into the interiors and we came to a school building. And this again had been built uh, as part of the border area development uh, program. And we were going around with the school teacher seeing the place when we realized that uh, two or three villages in the vicinity, the entire population of these villages had come there to meet us. And I think there had been a, there was a general excitement because we were visiting the school, but more importantly, because the school had come up uh, in that place. So under the border area development program, it is roads, bridges, clinics, schools, these kind of activities which are being undertaken, the program has been going on. The fourth cycle program have been completed and you know we are moving into the fifth cycle. And uh, the general sense is that uh, this program has done very well. Now, before I move on to the next item, uh, uh, let me just, uh, as far as border area development program is concerned, I was on a courtesy call to the minister when I had come and he was talking to me about this program. He said that, uh, he told me that ambassador, uh, uh, India-Myanmar border areas, I think one of the best things we have done is this border area uh, development program. 
and he said i have told the chinese ambassador that the that the chinese should also try and do uh, something on similar lines and uh, a couple of weeks later the chinese ambassador was leaving and you know i was in his farewell and he said the same thing to me he said that they have been advised by the minister to do something what india and myanmar are doing and subsequently this january when president xi jinping was out here uh, uh, we learned that a similar program has been put in place between uh, uh, myanmar and uh, uh, china uh, we have a similar program which we started much later for the state of rakhine because of the disturbances out there so uh, we have built 250 houses out there for the displaced uh, people but we are in the second cycle undertaking the socio economic uh, projects for rakhine uh, uh, state we have the free movement regime between our two countries uh, i think that again contributes to the movement of people and easing uh, their livelihood uh, in a different context i had visited chin state again uh, we had a, or rather we have a proposal of uh, building local connectivities between uh, uh, chin state and mizoram on the indian side and to have border huts on both the sides so that the people can uh, benefit i think this should uh, get going in not too distant a future final uh, 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 you know review of the uh, mode of operation is presently being undertaken by the indian side but uh, here again you know these bridges are so important because uh, under the free movement regime people staying on this side during months when the flow of water in the river is less use their four wheel drives or other means to go to for example champai is the major center on the indian side to do their shopping and uh, get various stuffs and stuff and bring it uh, to their villages because connectivity on their side backward connectivity is much more uh, difficult compared to connectivity on the on the indian side so uh, these there are several points where we would be having uh, bridges or other means where the links would be established and border huts are proposed to be uh, uh, established uh, uh, there uh, electricity uh, we have one connection at tamu more under which you know there is a 11 kv line uh, and electricity is being provided to myanmar in fact we had the joint working group and the joint steering committee meeting only yesterday through video conference between the two countries to have a radial connection and these connectivities would be in arunachal in uh, in manipur in uh, mizoram and you know uh, there is some proposal for nagaland also so that power electricity from india can be provided to the villages on 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 the uh, myanmar side now these are areas you know which are too distant uh, uh, from the national grid grid on the myanmar side and even when the grid expands you know it would be easier to provide electricity from the indian side and this is being seriously looked at and and and, and even the uh, tamu more uh, 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 present link would be upgraded uh, so that more electricity can be uh, sold uh, 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 there uh, bus connectivity using the trilateral highway uh, we all of us know about the trilateral highway uh, i think uh, uh, the uh, section of uh, kaleva yargi uh, of the trilateral highway should be complete in another one and a half to two years and as far as the bridges are concerned which were held up because of uh, a legal case i think those impediments have been removed and the work should start as soon as uh, the contract is given to the new uh, uh, contractor but we have been in discussion with the myanmar side for starting bus connectivity coordinated bus service was to start but because of covid conditions it could not so as soon as the conditions permit uh, uh, this would start i think this would be a big game changer in terms of uh, movement of people who otherwise cannot afford uh, traveling by 
air and uh, move between the two countries may it be for uh, health tourism may it be for uh, uh, religious uh, purposes but uh, uh, this would be an important uh, step uh, forward uh, Sitwe port should be operational soon. Uh, uh, we are looking at uh, the first quarter of next year. Dredging has to take place at the port. Uh, and once that is complete, the port should be operational, which would help uh, uh, the people in the coastal area and uh, along the Kaladan multimodal uh, project. Uh, the road connectivity, uh, which is the final part, I think we have difficulties there because of the troubled security conditions out there. But uh, when I have visited Sitwe, uh, you know, and the people I have interacted with, a lot of people in trade and commerce are waiting for this road connectivity to uh, be established. Uh, there are markets on the Indian side which they want access to. Uh, uh, and, and I suppose it must be vice versa also. Uh, I had had the opportunity of uh, discussing with Chief Secretary of Mizoram uh, uh, when I was at the Rikotar Zokatar crossing point, and he again said that you know there is a lot of enthusiasm on Mizoram side for this connectivity to uh, uh, establish uh, uh, infrastructure in the border areas in general is very very important, and Government of India and Government of Myanmar together are working to see that it is. Uh, enhanced and upgraded so that uh, movement of people, movement of trade can uh, take place in an easier manner. There is a lot of informal trade uh, which happens at present, which needs to be moved to the uh, formal uh, side. So I think that again is something which is being uh, looked at. Uh, we have uh, something called in Myanmar called the uh, uh, India-Myanmar Industrial Training Centers. Uh, there is a proposal to have one uh, in Rakhine state. Uh, we are looking at it in consultation with Myanmar government. And uh, this again would help uh, people in the area, giving them capabilities so as to get employed in uh, uh, industries which are coming up in different parts of uh, Myanmar. Hospitals also uh, uh, have been built by uh, Government of India uh, grant assistance. More can be done in this area. IT centers and uh, 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 contribution to agricultural machinery, et cetera, are activities which have been undertaken, uh, uh, which again uh, uh, contribute to the overall uh, uh, in bettering the livelihood and increasing opportunities for people who live in these border areas. But uh, 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 at a larger macro level, I think there is a need for a plan to be put in place as to what we would do uh, as to uh, uh, what we would be doing, what plans we have to develop our border areas I was talking to the trade minister here a few days ago, and he said that uh, he had been tasked by the government to visit uh, 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 Tamu because the government of Myanmar wants to work out a plan uh, 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 to develop the Tamu area and to put in place infrastructure over a long term period. And uh, 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 he said to me that uh, once COVID is behind us and once he's undertaken the visit, he would like to have a discussion with me so that uh, you know similar things are done on the Indian side. So uh, uh, we have, for example, there are other ideas also that there are, there are resources which are available in border areas as to how to exploit those. Uh, uh, there is a private company which owns a gas field which is in the proximity of India-Myanmar boundary. Uh, uh, they are in discussion with, uh, with ONGC to try and uh, dispose that of. So uh, the resources of that gas field, how they are to be utilized. So I think at some point of time down the line, I think uh, uh, greater thought needs to be given as to what we can do on our border areas, keeping in mind the opportunities, the resources which are available, 
so that uh, not only uh, the two countries benefit, but also the people, the population living in these border areas uh, benefits uh, from it. So uh, the idea of my speaking was just to uh, uh, tell you about my experience and what uh, uh, is happening. But I think uh, uh, I would really benefit from uh, new ideas, uh, 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 new thinking, which this forum might uh, throw up, which then can feed into uh, uh, government's uh, plan and both the governments can then see uh, uh, how best to move ahead uh, with these ideas. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Sarakumar. Uh, in fact, uh, you have so succinctly put uh, in the entire panorama of the development of the entire border areas uh, that uh, these, these are the ground realities which are going to help in planning any development macro plans that we can have on both sides. So it will be extremely useful. I'm sure the discussions that follow would be benefited from what you have just stated about the ground realities, what more needs to be done and what all of us can do together. Thank you so much once again. And uh, now I request, it's my great pleasure to request uh, His Excellency, the uh, Ambassador of U Republic of the Union of Myanmar to India, uh, Mr. Mo, Ong, Mo Xiao Ong, uh, can I request you for the second inaugural address? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Her Excellency, Dr. Najima Hatula, Honorable Governor of Manipur. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. R.K. Rajan, Member of Parliament, Manipur. His Excellency, Mr. Saurabh Kumar, Ambassador of India to Myanmar, uh, Mr. M.T. Epapua, uh, Mr. Sayabachi Tata, distinguished participants, distinguished panelists. It is my great honor and privilege to inaugurate this con conversation together with other dignitaries and scholars from India, as well as from Myanmar. I would, at the outset, like to take this opportunity to thank responsible official from ASEAN India Center, AIC, Research and Information System for Developing Countries, RIS, and the Asian Confluence for organizing this timely conversation. I would also like to express my sincere appreciation to the to be invited to deliver the address. Distinguished participant, the relation between Myanmar and India has received a boost from more substantive initiative in forging formal agreements and deepening economic, political, cultural, and people-to-people -people ties between them. The two countries have also embarked on elevating the relation to even higher levels of all aspects of cooperation. India and Myanmar enjoy age old cultural linkages, which also reflect people-to-people -people contact and interaction between two friendly countries. In terms of culture, both Myanmar and India share many common commonalities, such as heritage of religious, ethnic, and linguistic ties. Myanmar's policy of maintaining friendly relations with its neighbors and growing personal friendship among the leaders and India's ex policies coupled with the neighbor first policy have significantly generated much closer ties and broader cooperation in recent years. Bilateral relations between the two countries have been rigorously strengthened to take forward the existing relation to the level of full-fledged strategic partnership in all areas of cooperation. Against this backdrop, I would like to take this opportunity to brief on initiative to foster closer cooperation between India and Myanmar from the perspective of bilateral trade, connectivity, border trade, border areas development, scenario, and regional context. 
distinguished participant. In the bilateral trade and commerce sector, India ranked the fifth position as the trading partner country. In fiscal year 2017-2018, export to India decreased by 44.01% over the previous year, amounting to US dollar 441.98 million. But the volume of import from India increased by 5.6% over the previous year, amounted to 981 million. Total volume of trade with India decreased by 17.18% over the previous year, with the total value of US dollar 1,423 100, <clears throat> million. From October 2018 to 2000, August 2019 of fiscal year 2018-2019, Myanmar export volume to India increased by 59.95% over the same period of previous year, amounting to US dollar 598.85 million. However, import from India decreased. 19.75% over the same period of previous year, amounting to US dollar 709.61 million. Total volume of bilateral trade increased by 2.77% with the total amount of US dollar 1,308.46 million. In the context of connectivity initiative between Yamai and India, the major project is the Kaladar Multimodal Transit Transport Project. The framework agreement between Myanmar and India for the construction and operation of a multimodal transit transport facility on Kalajan River, connecting the city port in Myanmar with the state of Mizoram in India, was signed in April 2008. The project of city seaport is also part of Kalajan multimodal transit transport project. Upon this completion, the Kalajan multimodal transit transport project will connect the Eastern Indian seaport of Kolkata with Sitwe seaport in Rakhine State, Myanmar by sea. It will also link Sitwe seaport to Palewa, Chin State via the Kaladan River, Ogru, and then from Palewa to Mizoram State in Northeast India by road. The project will provide an attractive access to the Bay of Bengal from the northeastern part of India as the new route will connect economically isolated northeastern region of India to Sitri port of Myanmar. Therefore, it will help promote development of transportation sector and economic cooperation between the two countries. The project will also bring more trade opportunities to both countries as it will not only facilitate better transportation for Rakhine and Chin states, but give impetus to the development of tourism industry. Another flagship initiative is India Myanmar Thailand Trilateral Highway Project, which is under the Mekong Ganga Cooperation Initiative, was started in 2005. From the perspective of India, Myanmar is the gateway to Southeast Asia and entry point to link with ASEAN connectivity, as it is the only land bridge between connecting ASEAN and India. Therefore, the project of India Nima Trilateral Highway is largely funded by Indian government under the Act East policy. This project is significant to both India and Southeast Asian countries as it establishes connectivity to further trade and commerce between India and the ASEAN member states. Distinguished participant, as from regional context angle, Myanmar's membership of ASEAN, BIMSTEC, and Mekong Ganga cooperation has introduced a regional sub regional dimension to bilateral relations and imparted added significance in the context of Act East policy. Myanmar India time tested friendly relations go beyond bilateral context and the bilateral cooperation expanded under the regional and multilateral framework. Myanmar has generally been supportive of India's stand to various international organizations. Myanmar and India are closely cooperating 
and collaborating in ASEAN framework such as ASEAN India Dialogue, based of Bengal Initiative, Multi Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation, BIMSTEC, Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar, DCIM Economic Corridor, and South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation are the platform from Myanmar and India to consolidate friendship and intensify multifaceted cooperation in both bilateral and multilateral contexts. Distinguished participants, with regard to improving border cooperation, Myanmar and India are on the same page as both agree that terrorism constitutes a significant threat to peace and stability in the region and should be confronted in all its forms and manifestations. Since terrorism poses a threat to peace and stability of the countries of the world, Myanmar condemns terrorism, terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. Both countries share the view that it is important to maintain security and stability along the India-Myanmar borders, which is essential for the socio-economic development of the populations living in the border area. Myanmar has clearly reiterated that it will never allow any insurgent and negative element to use its own soil to engage in any hostile activities against its neighboring country, India. Myanmar also appreciates India's stance to uphold the same principle. Distinguished participants, border trade between Myanmar and India has a significant role to play from the microeconomic perspective of regional economic integration between South Asia and the Southeast Asia region. Border trade between Myanmar and India hit 194.6 million US dollar as of September 13 in the fiscal year 2018 to 2019. Meanwhile, Myanmar's border trade with four neighboring countries, China, India, Thailand, and Bangladesh totaled 9.6 billion US dollars, shared by 6.7 billion in US dollar in export and 2.9 million US dollar billion US dollar in import. Border trade between Myanmar and India is severely constrained by lack of information on number of goods which could be traded. <clears throat> Myanmar mainly exports to India fruits and vegetables, fishery and forestry products, while importing from India medicine, electronic products, motor bikes, cotton yarns, non alloy steel, and other construction materials. It is still perceived that only 62 items are permitted for trade. For the trade between Myanmar and India through the land routes does not get governed by just the border trade agreement. <clears throat> Distinguished participants, apart from trade aspect of convergence, the two countries have also been fostering cooperation in areas of border and connectivity. Efforts have been made to fulfill the need to further facilitate the easy movement of passengers and cargo traffic by streamlining procedures and expeditiously developing infrastructure. The two land border crossing points at Tamu Mori and Rikoda Zokoda have been opened as international border gates. The construction of the modern integrated check post will be implemented as phase one at Tamu, Myanmar. Bilateral motor vehicle agreement to facilitate cross-border movement of vehicle is underway. A coordinated bus service between Infal and Mandalay has been planned to launch this year, but delayed by the COVID. <clears throat> Emphasizing the importance of promoting the well-being of people in the remote areas across the border of two countries, both sides agree to commence the establishment of the border hut with priority to carry out the pilot project. Under the Myanmar-India Border Area Development Programs, 
India has been providing infrastructure and socioeconomic development in Chin State and Naga Self administered region through the Indian Grant in Aid projects. Under this 43 school, 18 health centers, and 51 bridges and roads have been constructed in the above areas over the last three years, and 29 additional projects under the fourth year's French assistance of US dollar 5 million will be implemented in 2020-21. Distinguished participants, despite the feasible initiative and ample opportunities have been accelerated in terms of trade, physical connectivity, and geographical proximity, certain challenges still exist in normalizing trade between India and Myanmar. As I have mentioned earlier, total volume of trade between India and Myanmar is in downward trend, whereas border trade is also severely constrained. As the trade basket is narrow and subject to wide fluctuation, both sides should take steps to bolster trade across the land border as well as overseas trade. Two important developments have taken place since operationalization of border trade agreement. This might include a shift from barter to normal trade that can take place through then border. With the normalization of trade flows, two other policy mechanisms become relevant. A, the unilateral duty-free tariff reference scheme, EFTP scheme of India, and ASEAN-India Trade and Goods Agreement, AITGA. The broad provision contained in these two policy framework for Myanmar-India normal trade through the land border need to be explored by the business from both sides. As all have known, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic has hampered the global economy and has brought distancing in physical communication of business and disruption of supply chain of various industries all over the world. Therefore, every country has been trying to mitigate and remediate the adverse impact of COVID-19. With the prevailing situation, the economic recovery will take time, but I believe that this situation will also open up new opportunities for Myanmar economy. I am quite op optimistic that with the systematic implementation of the existing relief plan and enhancing cooperation with partner countries like India, Myanmar will completely overcome the impact of COVID-19 on its economy. Towards this, further collaboration is imperative to bring about new normal models of development for post-COVID. Distinguished participants, in conclusion, I'm confident that being a neighborhood, Myanmar is best positioned to play a crucial role in bridging India and other ASEAN member states for closer economic ties. From this standpoint, India's Northeast region represents as the heart of India's Aquis policy and strategically important as a gateway to Southeast Asia. As I have mentioned earlier, leveraging physical connectivity to integrate and promote socioeconomic interaction between India's Northeast states and Myanmar will enormously complement the existing dynamic of all aspects of Indo Myanmar cooperation. Prioritizing connectivity improvement and border trade promotion will invariably speed up other potentials of improving agriculture sector, boosting tourism, health and educational sector, as well as generating livelihood of communities of border areas along the two countries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. Ambassador Ong, uh, you have given us such an excellent overview of a wide range of areas, trade, connectivity, multilateral cooperation, 
and you have brought in the very important context of security as part of the socioeconomic development. You have also emphasized on the border trades, which are very, very significant for India, Myanmar, uh, prosperity in the border areas. Thank you so much, and this will be extremely helpful in the, in the panel's discussions in the coming sessions. And uh, we look forward to you, and thank you again for your cooperation, and we look forward to collaboration with you in future as well. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's my great pleasure to request uh, a voice from the people, perhaps, the people's representative, Mr. R. K. Ranjan, Member of Parliament. And uh, can I request you for your special address? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Namaskar, Dr. Hazma Nepulaji, Honorable Governor of Manipur, Kathe, India. His Excellency, Sri Sarap Kumarji, Ambassador of India to Myanmar. His Excellency, Sri May Chau Ong Ji, Ambassador of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar to India, Minglava. Uh, Sri MP Pez Barwazi, Namaskar, Chairman Governing Council, Asian Conflicts, and other distinguished participants. I pay my respect and regard to all the participants. Today, the two major Asian riverine nation is confluence under Brahmaputra Ayavadi Convention, con uh, conversations on Indo-Myanmar cooperation for vibrant and prosperous <laughs> border. I'm extremely privileged to join this momentous event today and sharing some of my humble thought on the vibrant and prosperous John in the Indo-Myanmar region. After decades of isolation, India's eastern neighbor, Myanmar is now perceived as a link to new capacity building of trade and commerce. The transformation of look East policy into the most coveted at East policy has also added to the significance of Myanmar in India's consideration of foreign policy. Over the years, India's policy towards Myanmar has been largely shaped by security and stability at the border, diffusing cross-border insurgence group and economic development of the Northeastern states. Accordingly, Myanmar has extended all support of our uh, curbing insurgency and militancy on its border. Reciprocity of the Indian side uh, on the Indian side is visible in supporting Myanmar to promote democratic values and rebuild its institution along the socio-economic reforms. So far as India's interest in Myanmar is concerned, it is stepping up its development corporations in the light of the Myanmar's continuing reform process. It is also rejuvenating its historical and cultural tie. Though sheer historical cultural linkages between India and Myanmar abound our mythologies and literature and the influence that India has on its captivating land cannot be underestimated. Both India and Myanmar have agreed to start a cultural exchange program, CEP, with a wide range of activities, introducing dance, music, yoga, tantra, martial art like Burmese tan, etc. to deepen the close bonds between the peoples of India and Myanmar, to foster and strengthen cultural relations and mutual understanding between India and other country, Indian Council for Cultural Relations was established in 1950-51 and many cultural 
excellence program have been organizing between India and Myanmar for the last many decades and keeping effort to leverage on soft power diplomacy and fostering deeper economic and business link. For boosting its engagement with Myanmar, India has kept its focus on development assistance, supporting through grant in aid, line of credit, training programs, and provision for expert knowledge and capacity building initiatives. The high impact community development project and the border area development project have been crucial in reaching out to the states in the border region of Myanmar and boosting the people to people contest. In its recent effort under India-Myanmar Friendship Project, India has handed over 250 prefabricated houses in the Rakhine state for the rehabilitation of refugees after their return. It is already mentioned by our honorable ambassador to Burma. According to our prime minister, I quote, the extent and depth of the India-Myanmar relationship is visible in the robust development cooperation partnership, which has a strong people first philosophy. India stands ready to enhance our development partnership with Myanmar and do so as per the priorities of the Myanmar government, unquote. Along with the sheer culture, cultural and historical linkage, India has a great deal to offer religion, spiritualism, and film industry in the form of Buddhism, yoga, and Bollywood have been the strength of India's soft power diplomacy. And it has been a connecting ground, ground with Myanmar for centuries. Therefore, it may be said that India is a neighbor which Myanmar cannot afford to ignore. There is also demand that India government should introduce international bus service linking Moray with Mandalay. The bus service linking Moray with Mandalay would not only just help the trader, but also bring in tourists from Myanmar to India. Nevertheless, the engagement with India in recent time in the economic field and the trade statistics have not been satisfactory. The two countries have also signed several bilateral investment promotion agreement facilitating, facilitating their venture in each other country as of April 2019, India's investment in Myanmar reached $767 million, ranking 11th in the lineup of foreign investors with 30 permitted enterprises. The range of area covered by Indian project includes roads, railway, telecom, power, energy, hydrocarbon, remote sensing, agriculture, industry, IT, healthcare services, and education. Several Indian companies are already made in, in roads such as ONGC Bidesh Limited, Jubilee Oil and Gas, Escort, Tata Motor, Isar Energy, Rights, Apollo, Sipla, Rambaxi, Kadila, Healthcare Let, etc. The Government of India and the Government of Union of Myanmar bearing in mind the friendly relations existing between the two countries, firmly believing that the formal delimitation and demarcation of the entire traditional boundary between the Republic of India and the Union of Burma will further strengthen the friendly relation between the two countries. Education is a crucial area where India exercises competitive advantage in Myanmar for building a sustainable academic partnership between the two countries. Myanmar 
attests high priority to education and is calling to increase investment in this sector, enhancing stro strong academic link between institutions of India and Myanmar and re replicating best learning practices will help in human resource development and contribute to the social and economic transformation of the country. 3,200 kilometers bilateral highway project connecting More, and Man More, More in Manipur to Mesto in Thailand via Myanmar is expected to be completed soon. The building of railroad connected Myanmar to other Southeast Asian country and reviving all railroads linked from Assam to Vietnam call for much attention. Investment in agriculture, industry, banking sector, education, health, transport, and communication is urgently required by India. Besides its extending share in pearls and pulses, timber, oil, and natural gas project. Last but not the least, engagement with the Tatmado, NLD, and the ethnic parties, and the trek second diplomacy at the level of the civil society, cultural, and academic access may go a long way in strengthening ties between the two countries. While India, Myanmar share threat relations in many areas, but post COVID-19 can expand threat relations in areas such as pharmacy, healthcare, transport, food processing, steel, renewable energy, communication, communication, and other things can help both the countries to revive. The region is yet to prepare for opportunity, and there is a big region's infrastructure and rejuvenated cultural connection here, we may emphasize on 3C, such as culture, commerce, and connectivity. Regime transformations and political development in Myanmar since the last few years have often a new chapter in India-Myanmar relations. The traditional relations of friendship and cooperation between the two countries could be defined and identified further to each other mutual benefit. Thank you. Jeju Timare, Jai Hind. Thank you, Mr. Ranjan, for your very go good overview on the soft diplomacy, cultural power, people's to people power, and all those areas. I am sure <clears throat> these are the areas we will discuss and we will come to some uh, definite uh, way forward. Now I have the great pleasure of requesting with my sincere apologies uh, to Excellency Dr. Nazma Haptullah, uh, the Honorable Governor of Manipur, for the keynote address and uh, we have been waiting for. Because of technical <coughs> breaks in between, we had to interrupt uh, the request and I sincerely apologize for that. And uh, uh, the Excellency, Dr. Haptullah. Mr. Beth Barwa, Chairman, Governing Council, Asian Confluence in the form of Member Northeastern Council. His Excellency Saurabh Kumar, Ambassador of India to Myanmar. His Excellency Mr. Mao Q Ong, Ambassador of Republic of Union of Myanmar to India. And Mr. R. K. Ranjan Singh, Member of Parliament Lok Sabha. I am indeed delighted to deliver the keynote address at this Brahmaputra IORD conversation organized by the Asian Confluence in collaboration with the Asian Indian Center, New Delhi, the, the, the Mandalay Forum for East Asian Students, Myanmar, and Manipur University, and the, the title Indo Myanmar Cooperation for Vibrant and Prosperous Border Zone. I'm very happy to say that I had an opportunity to visit Myanmar and I travel up to Mandalay. The ambassador, Indian ambassador, Mr. Bhaskar Mitra, when he was there, is a good, great friend. And on his personal invitation, me and my daughter, we traveled to Myanmar. And my visit was most informative 
a very interesting and I learned a lot during the, the, those few days that I was in Myanmar. Myanmar and India shared a long geographical border and shared heritage. In addition, Brahmaputra River, the symbol of the life and people of the northeastern state of India and the Ayurveda River largely shaped the culture, livelihood for the people of Myanmar. Both regions are primarily agrarian economies, having immense biodiversity, natural beauty, rich cultural heritage, and ample water resources. Connectivity projects are also being implemented, such as India, Myanmar, Thailand, Thailand Trilateral Highway, Kaladan Multimodal Transit Transport Project, Irrigation, Electricity Development, Health, Education, and many other socio economic projects. Overland connectivity between India and Myanmar and the rest of the ASEAN countries through Myanmar has been discussed for over two decades now. Action on the ground has, however, been delayed due to various factors, including difficult terrain, lack of adequate commercial interest, and need for large financial resources, and adverse security situation with attend risk. Recent years have been fresh initiative being taken by India in close cooperation with Myanmar. The Kaladan Multimodal Transit Transport Project, whose implementation began in 2010, is making progress. The Tumu Kalia Kaliwa Road in Myanmar, built by India in 2001, is now in the process of becoming a part of the trilateral highway between India, Myanmar, and Thailand. Other, after the remaining section, under construction or upgradation get completed. Connectivity between Mizoram state and Myanmar will get a boost after the construction of the Thai Tedam road in Myanmar, which India has agreed to undertake. Prospect also appeared better for railway connectivity between the two countries once Railway connectivity between the two countries, once the railway on the Indian side gets expanded to India-Myanmar border on which work is underway. Several interrelated aspects assume importance now. First is the timely completion of all these projects. Second is the need for transforming these connectivity corridors into development corridors with thriving trade investment and other commercial activities for mutual benefit. Supportive infrastructure for supply of power, communication and IT links and creation of capacities for skill development and training are essential. Putting in place efficient border trade transaction arrangement would also be very important. Additionally, further strengthening of the inland connectivity within India and within Myanmar would help with the benefits and participation. India Lukis policy represents its efforts to cultivate extensive economic and strategic relation with the nation of Southeast Asia in order to bolster its standing as a regional power and as a counterweight to the strategic influence of the People's Republic of China. Initiated in 1991, it marked a strategic shift in India's perspective of the world. It was developed and enacted during the government of Prime Minister Shri P. V. Narasimharao and rigorously persuaded by the successive administrations of Shri Atal Bihari Vajpayee and Dr. Manmohan Singh. Shri Nandin Modiji, Honorable Prime Minister, accorded high priority to India turn East look into East Act policy. However, during the 11th plan period, Manipur has not been benefited nevertheless. 
some important initiative made by the government of Manipur and central government ministry of donor are highlighted in short. Introduction of bus service between Imphal and Mantle in Myanmar at least once a week during winter and non rainy season. Concerned ministry is already conveyed in principal approval. At the instance of the Ministry of Donor, it is proposed to revive border trade along Indo-Myanmar border in three locations, one in each border district, Chandel, Ukrul, and Churachanpur, have been identified by state government for establishment of border hearts in Manipur. 40 items are permitted for border trade between India and Myanmar. In addition, government of Manipur had already submitted proposal for increasing another 15 more items under border trade for consideration in India Myanmar JTC meeting. Introduction of rupee kaya trade as permitted on the Indo Nepal and Indo Bhutan border in order to facilitate former border trade between India and Myanmar. Land customs station already exists at More. Integrated check post at Moray is being developed under phase one program of the D Department of Border Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, and has to be expedited completion. IT and telecommunication, improving telecommunication network by installing optical fiber link for six kilometers between Moray and the Tamu near at Myanmar. As far as education sector is concerned, Manipur University is teaching Burmese and Japanese language in its lingua in its language school, such as program of teaching and learning of languages of the Southeast Asia and other neighboring countries among our youth, professionals and businessmen is perhaps one of the programs action plan to be implemented under India's look east policy. Manipur University has even opened a center for Myanmar studies in the year 2005. Higher Education Department is making an humble attempt to introduce Myanmar's language as an el elective subject in More College border town of Manipur near Myanmar. Apart from the points stated above I would like to make a mention about the tour, tourism for the Northeast region. Tourism is the fast track for socioeconomic development the world over. Its multiplier effect in employment generation is unmatched. It is vital role is poverty elevation and economic growth is well recognized. The state of Northeast region are blessed with nature's bounty. The wooded mountains, the deep gorges with winding rivers, rolling hills, and lush green valleys are an exquisite picture of scenic beauty. The region is treasure house of biodiversity, flora, and fauna. The colorful and rich heritage add to the beauty of the picturesque surroundings. In other words, it is paradise unexplored, an ideal distinction for the tourists domestic and both international. The tremendous potential for tourism in this region needs to be exploited for the economic growth and prosperity of the people. I'm very happy the different contribution by Indian ambassador to Myanmar and the Myanmar ambassador to India and Mr. R. Kiranjan was very useful and I'm sure the discussion taking place by the different panelists and participants will add to our knowledge of how other areas can be explored for Indo-Myanmar cooperation for future generations to come. I thank you very much, Jay. Thank you, Your Excellency, Honorable Governor, respected Abdullahji. Uh, we sincerely, very sincerely thank you for your very insightful keynote address covering almost all aspects of cooperation which are underway or which can be underway in future. 
you have mentioned about the importance of connectivity. You have, import, you have emphasized the implementation of projects as a priority. You have talked about border trades, which is so vital for this relationship. You have talked about skill development and tourism, which is rightly emphasized can be a game changer in the Northeast as well as our Myanmar relationship. Apart from your very uh, encouraging keynote address, which will be taken up by the discussions for further carrying forward, going forward, we are grateful for your presence here because that conveys a very strong message of commitment to the issues under consideration and the importance of the relationship between these two countries and between Northeast and Myanmar. Personally, I would like to thank you again and uh, grateful because tourism has been my passion. I was secretary of tourism for five years. I had met, seen you from a distance once in a while in meetings and always, always remember those, uh, your guidance and encouraging words. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, again. Now, uh, Shaiba. Uh, so, uh, a very, very uh, warm and uh, sincere thank you to all our esteemed uh, uh, members and panelists and esteemed dignitaries who has who have taken the time and uh, to address us in the first session. Uh, may I propose a short uh, vote of thanks uh, for this inaugural session, uh, and after which we will be moving to the next session. Uh, of course. Uh, uh, Everybody is welcome to, to stay back. There are many questions uh, on the chat box and we will be addressing them in the next question. Um, I take this opportunity to uh, offer a, 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 a short vote of thanks. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, Dr. Najma Heptullah, the Honorable Governor of Manipur, thank you for your encouragement and thank you for your warm words of support. Uh, your Excellency, the Ambassador, Mr. Saurabh Kumar, Your Excellency, Mr. Ong, the Ambassador of Myanmar to India, Dr. R.K. Ranjan, uh, the Honorable MP. I'm sorry that we had to uh, have a disruption in the audio in between. Uh, and to the uh, Chair, on behalf of all of us at the Asian Confluence, Dr. Prabir Day at the ASEAN India Center, and the Mandalay Forum for East Asian Studies. It's my honor and pleasure to uh, thank you and uh, uh, looking forward and please continue to guide this effort uh, as we move forward, not only to the next session of this dialogue, but also in the upcoming areas of uh, follow-up of this important dialogue. Thank you again very much. There are a few, uh, Dr. Prabir Day, would you, like to introduce the next uh... so let's go straight to the next session session to the panel discussions on the theme uh Brahm Brahma the dialogue and uh we have the pleasure to invite uh, ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay to chair it and we have um, panelists both from think tanks and industry associations uh, practitioners from both uh, India Myanmar while doing this dialogue we thought to have more presence of, from the region, like Manipur, Northeastern part of India, and also from the Myanmar. So we have a time about uh, one hour, uh, nine, 30 minutes, and uh, some, you know, uh, the, the ground rule that let's restrict on 10 minutes and go for more into the Q&A, so that, you know, we, we have more interaction. Of course, uh, I can see there are uh, Myanmar specialists who, who even speak in, Myanmar language, uh, like Professor Sapna Bhattacharji, you know, many others here, you know, I can see they are, you know, they are waiting to uh, launch the question to us. So I'm sure this is going to be a very, very interactive and interesting session. And with that note, I hand over this to uh, Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadha uh, to use her to moderate, to chair the session, guide us, uh, the whole discussion, and uh, looking forward to have more, more and more support and blessings from you, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you, Prabir, and thank you, Sabia, and thank you also the other partners associated with, with this event for inviting me to, to chair and moderate the uh, what we can call the expert session 
of the Brahmaputra Ayavadi Dialogue on India Myanmar cooperation for a vibrant and prosperous border zones. Um, as we heard, and I'm very grateful to Her Excellency, the Governor of Manipur, Dr. Nagma Hepkulla, uh, Mr. Bez Barua himself, uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador of India to uh, Myanmar, uh, Mr. Saurabh Kumar, uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador of Myanmar to India, uh, Dr. Uh, Mucho Ong, uh, as well as uh, Honorable Member of Parliament, uh, uh, Mr. R.K. Ranjan, uh, for their comments in the first session. Uh, I think one of the important points about this event and one of the important points picked up by Ambassador Saurabh Kumar was that while we are doing a lot, while in particular the government is doing a lot in order to enhance connectivity between India and Myanmar and further, further east, and in a lot, there are a lot of government programs involved in this kind of connectivity projects, the Kaladan, the India Thailand Trilateral Highway, the 69 Bridges, the Retidim Road, uh, and there is also a lot going on in other areas, whether it is education, capacity building, border area development, community development. Uh, while there's a lot that is happening on that front, uh, what we need to see is what is also happening on the ground or what uh, Sabia has in his concept note talked about under the bridges. Uh, so, you know, we are, these are all strategic projects linking India to Southeast Asia and linking, let's say, the Northeast to the Bay of Bengal. But how do people uh, in between uh, profit from it? Is the region just going to be a transit region? How can the local people make the best of it? And there, while we see a lot happening at the level of government and state, uh, I'm not sure, sure we have seen the exact commensurate level of activity at the level of people, enterprise, business, uh, non-governmental uh, organizations. Sabia is doing a grand job in that area. So how do we connect? How do we connect uh, the, 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 the hinterland to, this, uh, to these connectivity projects? And of course, there's a lot that can be done. There are also alternative perspectives. One perspective could be a strategic perspective, look in terms of big projects uh, and high big investments, you know, capital intensive uh, and, and, you know, uh, sort of major revenue generating projects. But a lot of stuff can happen at the level of the people. How do we bring in people, people to people activity, particularly in the economic area? We tend to associate people to people relations with the cultural and perhaps other tourism and other related areas. But how about bringing people to people together through businesses? So in this connection, I just would like to pose a few questions that I'm sure the panelists themselves, and we have a really expert panel as well as, uh, uh, you know, as well as some others who will be uh, speaking to us today. Uh, so I'd just like to pose a series of questions that I think are relevant to this dialogue, the Ayavadi Brahmaputra dialogue, as well as to this idea of prosperous border zones. And one of them is, while connectivity is surely very, very important, uh, it is uh, indispensable, uh, how much are we, attention are we giving to the whole idea of local productivity so that the local productivity is hooked and linked onto these connectivity projects? What are those areas where local productivity can be enhanced? Uh, are they going to be in uh, heavy industries, light industries? The majority of the people on both sides of the border uh, live in subsistence farming, agriculture and allied activities, horticulture, animal husbandry, fisheries, forest produce. These are what constitute their livelihood and the possibilities of earning something more from their livelihood. What are governments on both sides? While they may be building schools and bridges and roads, what are governments on both sides actually doing to enhance the power of people's livelihoods? Uh, how, um, you know, then beyond that, what are the kind of exportable project, uh, products that they can, uh, that they are developing? Exports from Myanmar, the border regions to India, exports from India, the border regions to Myanmar and maybe further afield. Uh, what kind of industries are most suitable? Heavy, light or small and medium enterprises, particularly small and medium enterprises that process the products that are, are grown uh, locally. Very often, we tend to mix natural resources, which often tend to be extractive, and primary products. It's the agri-sector and allied sectors that provide the primary products that really needs to, uh, you know, needs to be 
magnify or amplify augmented so that value can be added employment can be generated entrepreneurship can be promoted uh why what is the current status of the ICT uh, how successful has it been in promoting formal trade how efficient has been the movement from the border trade regime to the MFM or formal trade regime my understanding is that in fact while we have moved to a formal trade regime we simply have no formal trade and whatever little uh, uh, legal trade that was taking place has also collapsed uh, what about the dftp the dftp is a potentially game changing initiative by the government of india which allows for international and especially indian investment in the least developed countries of southeast asia our most immediate neighbor uh, myanmar and that to the border regions for export to the entire indian market of 1.4 billion is that dftp being used if if not why how much has the issue of third country trade and certificates of origin come in the way of border trade at the india myanmar border uh some some of the panel with some of the you know the audience has asked questions on the obstacles created understandably by covid-19 and they are anxious to know how we are going to overcome that but in many ways covid-19 also uh, allows us an opportunity to change the kind of uh, the development narrative and the model of development which is top down that we have adopted so far can we think of more bottom up approaches for example the amul model of cooperative uh, 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 you know corporate cooperative model in which ownership is still with the people it is cooperative in ownership but corporate in model with technical inputs technological inputs markets data better management how would that work uh, people have also raised issues of sustainable development water resources microplastics flowing into uh, the uh, to the bay of bengal how can we address those issues and finally particularly because we have the presence of the uh, you know the country representative of the ministry of economy trade and investment of japan uh, mr kg uh, onozawa uh, we would also like to flag the question of how can japan contribute to greater northeast productivity myanmar productivity and greater northeast myanmar relationship and more than just myanmar why we cannot we think of making it a strategic relationship that connects the eastern part of india all the eastern part of india represented by the bbin all the way up to the south china sea up to vietnam and do activity so with those general questions uh, let me uh, sort of just a quick introduction our speaker uh, we will have a special address by mr kg uh, onozawa we look forward very much to that uh, presentation dr onozawa has uh, done a masters in columbia university and uh, since 2018 He is the regional representative of the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, based in South South Asia, based in Delhi, and uh, he focuses on a variety of India-Japan economic issues, including the digital partnership, startup ecosystems, and trilateral cooperation uh, on the platform for Japan-India business cooperation in the Asia-Africa region. So he is really well placed to give us a kind of strategic vision of East Asia. the role of southeast asia and the northeast uh, india in that linking up to the indian ocean and up to the western end of the indian ocean into africa uh, so i will invite all the speakers one by one and introduce them one by one uh, let me first invite uh, uh, mr onozawa for his presentation and then this will be followed by mr prabhu day for his expert presentation mr onozawa the floor is yours Uh, thank you very much ambassador for introducing me and uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me today uh, i want to use a presentation file so uh, uh, can somebody upload my presentation file on the screen yeah uh, thank you very much so i will start so uh, today uh, i will try to answer the questions uh, by the ambassador and uh, uh, basically uh, i will explain three points first uh, japan's experience for economic growth by connectivity 
And second, Japan's contribution in Indian Northeastern region and Myanmar. Third, some recommendations for India and Myanmar. So uh, let's go on to the next page. Uh, Japan has been growing rapidly in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. The growth rate was around 10% on average in 60s. Connectivity played one of the main roles to realize this rapid growth. Japan has several big cities, Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka. We connected these cities through highways, roads, freight, freight railways, and HSR, high-speed railways. This area is called Taiheo Belt. And not only big cities, but also small cities became prosperous. <clears throat> Connectivity boosted tourism, making commuting to large cities easier. More people came to small cities to live. Industries grew. grew. <clears throat> Namely, connectivity facilitated the economic integration between cities, and those cities di divided their world. Prioritization is the key to become competitive because we can enjoy scale economy. Uh, next page, please. Uh, there are several connectivity projects between Northeast region in India and Myanmar, including BCIM, trilateral highways, etc. These projects will boost the economy. In order to take advantage of the scale economy, each state in NER in India and Myanmar must be connected to other areas. To take an example, a Japanese automobile company Honda built a factory in Bangladesh in November 2018. They started to exchange parts between Manesar factory and Bangladesh factory. It is a division of role and prioritization between these factories. That is why they can make the cost cheaper than before. This type of economic integration is important to boost the economic growth and improve the competitiveness and attractiveness. Uh, next page, please. Uh, <clears throat> Japanese government and JICA has been contrib contributing to many infrastructure development in Northeast region. JICA is supporting building roads and bridges in Meghalaya, Mizoram, Tripura, Assam, etc. Next page, please. In Myanmar also, Japanese government and JICA is supporting <coughs> many connectivity projects, including building roads, railways, bridges, ports, etc. Next page, please. Uh, connectivity is not limited to physical infrastructure. Trade facilitation is also important. So BBIN Motor Vehicle Agreement was signed in 2015. This type of harmonization is very important. ASEAN has been active to harmonize and align the quality standards in several sectors. They signed several mutual recognition agreements in, for example, electrical and electronic equipment, cosmetic sector, pharmaceutical sector, and automotive parts. India should not be isolated from this movement. Prime Minister Modi stressed the importance of being part of global value chain. Quality standard harmonization is a key to facilitate India's engagement to global value chain. India should learn from ASEAN. Uh, let's think about why Bangladesh is growing so fast these days, especially in apparel and textile sectors. I can point out two reasons. First, Bangladesh has an FTA with large market, including EU. Second, they can take advantage of abundant non-skilled laborers, while India cannot take advantage of the same strength because labor regulations are too strict. Indian companies are trying to be small, trying to keep the number of employees to be less than 100. If they employ more than that threshold, they have to comply with the strict labor regulations. This is the impediment for India to enjoy scale economy and to be competitive in global ex exports market. And on the flip side, we can come up with some solutions very easily. First, India should keep her efforts to reform labor regulations. Second, India should improve the usage ratio of FTA, free trade agreements. 
India can improve the trade deficit by herself. According to the uh, Asian Development Bank study, the utilization rate of India's FTAs varies between 5% and 25%. This is one of the lowest in Asia. Jetro, a PSU under my ministry, did a survey towards Japanese companies in India. According to the survey, around half of Japanese companies in India are using improving the usage rate of India's FTA will mitigate the trade deficit. Next page, please. Uh, I want to point out one area that Japan and Myanmar can learn from India. I was fascinated by the achievement of India's tech. It is one of the most successful case of inclusive growth in the world. Uh, Nanda Nirekanin, the CEO, a uh, former CEO of Infosys and now the chairman of Infosys, designed and led this, pro uh, this project. When I met him in Bangalore, he told me data should be used to empower people and technology enables it. I wrote a big report on India stack to my ministry headquarters, and now Japan is trying to learn from India. After the COVID-19 outbreak, cash transfers has become a hot issue in Japan, and now Japanese government is trying to link the national ID to bank accounts. After the COVID-19 outbreak, India has done this direct benefit transfer with astounding speed to support performers. About 87 million such households received 2,000 rupees in each transfers to the bank account during April through direct benefit transfer. Moreover, this was done in less than a month after the announcement on March the 28th. It's so rapid. The ability to distribute such small amount is also the proof that the administrative costs are small and negligible. Last September, I traveled to Ghana and Rwanda, and I met several ministers and secretaries. <clears throat> and they are very keen to develop similar digital infrastructure. I heard Philippines is also trying to develop the national ID project with India. I think it's worth for Myanmar to think about the similar path. And uh, uh, next page, please. Uh, finally, I want to introduce a B2B a business to business platform to facilitate collaboration in Asia and Africa and India and Japan. JETRA and CII are the nodal body to facilitate business matching. There are four categories of cooperation that we aim to achieve. First, exports to Asia and Africa by Japanese companies based in India. And uh, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> infrastructure, second, infrastructure projects in Asia and Africa. Third, joint investment in Asia and Africa uh, business uh, through a JV structure. And uh, fourth, India's tax expansion into Asia and Africa. To take an example, Japanese trading houses, including Marubeni, Sumitomo, and Mitsui, will build a liquefied natural gas fired power plant in Myanmar. This is a two billion US dollar deal, so one of the biggest investments by Japanese companies in the Southeast Asian countries. Indian companies like ONGC and Gale also have a presence in oil and gas sector in Myanmar, including offshore gas development projects. Uh, actually, I have no concrete idea immediately, but we have the potential to collaborate between these uh, Japan, Myanmar, India uh, countries. So we want to facilitate this type of projects. So uh, that's all. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Onozawa. And thank you also for keeping perfectly on time. Uh, uh, you have given us a very broad picture, a very big picture. Uh, a lot of what Japan is doing, ideas that can be picked up to improve the level and quality of our trade. I particularly note the comments that you made on firstly labor reform and secondly, usage of the free trade agreements. Uh, it is really true that in fact, uh, our usage of the free trade agreements is not optimum, in fact, well below optimum. And in a way that it also links with this whole DFTP idea. Uh, so the question in my mind uh, is, is trade enough? Uh, how much importance do we need to attach to investment? 
along with trade. In other words, a lot of the trade that will develop between India and Myanmar and beyond uh, will probably be investment late trade. And Indian companies and India as a whole should take advantage of the ASEAN economic community and the lower tariffs that you have for intra-ASEAN trade inside the ASEAN community uh, to invest in Myanmar, uh, bearing in mind that you have two, three huge markets. The first is the 600 uh, billion, uh, 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 600 million ASEAN market. The second is the 1.4 billion Indian market. And the third is the entire FTA market that includes Japan, Korea, China, uh, uh, Australia. Uh, so, you know, this is a huge opportunity for investors uh, worldwide, but I would say particularly from India, to invest in the ASEAN economic community, starting off with the least developed countries, the CLMV countries, Myanmar being the closest amongst them, uh, to think of enhancing our presence to virtually a strategic level, and of course, promoting cross-border trade. Anyway, that was just as a point of comment uh, to perhaps add to a little value. Uh, so now we have, uh, you know, Mr. Kobe Day. Mr. Kobe Day is actually one of the foremost and clearly one of the most prolific uh, experts that we have on uh, India-ASEAN trade. Uh, we are, you know, particularly sort of uh, privileged that he also happens to be a professor at the Research and Information System for Developing Countries and the coordinator uh, of the ASEAN India Center at the RIS. Uh, he's been working in the field of international economics, and I think his contribution to the knowledge and awareness of uh, India, ASEAN trade in general, uh, as well as the identification of problems is second to, to none. Uh, he will give us his expert presentation, and after that, we will go to the panelists. Uh, uh, Dr. Date. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, please, sir. Thank, you. thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, may I request uh, Asian Conference to give me the uh, right to share my screen? I have a short presentation. It is presented in Tapal. Yeah. In the morning, uh, the, the previous sessions, we had um, several you know, eminent speakers, uh, the dignitaries that spoke about today's panel discussion, today's uh, uh, the title of the topic of the, uh, the webinar to Brahmaputta Iowa the dialogue India Myanmar cooperation for vibrant and prosperous border zones and uh, with your opening remarks and fantastic uh, presentation by uh, Kenichi Kechi Onojawatan so so it's my task is less I I will be only just giving you the overall the picture that's uh, we, we do with when you look at uh, Myanmar and the Southeast Asia. And uh, to share some of my thoughts to that, we can have some panel discussions when we talk about from India-Myanmar cooperations for vibrant and prosperous border zones. To start with, I thought that this is a picture, you know, uh, which is, you know, you can see this is the NASA picture. And it, what it tells that the region that the below the bridge, Ambassador Sarak Kumar, uh, the concept of Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay said that below the bridge this is very vital, the darker side. This is a picture we take a took in from the NASA in 2017. It's really dark, and that northeastern part of India and the Myanmar. The illuminating part is nearest in the Yangon, or in Bangkok, or you know nearest in the Kolkata, like that. So, so dialogue like this will give an out-of-box ideas, you know, and which could help us policymakers to take the, some of the positions in a way forward you know, to implement uh, those of the uh, decisions or the recommendations. So it's a really, you know, challenging task. So how do you illuminate? So I have some, you know, uh, let's discuss uh, to the, you know, some slides and presentations in the field of trade and connectivity, sociocultural areas. And then I leave it the floor when there are the people who will talk about it, the debate on, on today's the, you know, theme. First of all, the, what why is uh, a Myanmar and India is so so special to us? Two great rivers uh, connecting world's ancient civilizations. So we have a very strong cultural links between Northeast India of in Myanmar and rest part of it, Myanmar and on the rest of in India as well. This is very do well documented. I'm not going to repeat it. So two nations very well integrated by you know 
of history, the ancient civilization, and in the contemporary period, we have the relations between them since the British India and then at, at the present moment. And we have at the moment, you know, active vision where uh, Northeast India and Myanmar also a land bridge connecting South Asia and Southeast Asia. Myanmar India always give, it, give a huge priority to for closer contacts upon the people inhabiting these two river basins, Bermapulta and Ayavarti. We have a very strong cooperation projects on the tourism, culture, education, transportation, communications. Both the countries which I, I felt and I, I look at it, it's the unity and diversity. That's what the, both Myanmar and India, they, they have been promoting their practice in it. Common land and maritime borders, shared culture and heritage, access to Bay of Bengal. Both Myanmar and India, you, know, you agree with me, this is a rule-based society. The rules are documented. So, and uh, we need to, you know, built on those rules through the constitutions, through the legal system, courts, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Both India and Myanmar are the founding members of the United Nations, multilateralism, part of several regional cooperation programs that have been discussed and reminded to us in the in the in the inaugural session by the ambassador Myanmar to India and also our ambassador to Myanmar, like in ASEAN, BIMSTEC, and PASEC. The quick four points that tells us why it is so special. Let's move into when we talk about where activists, or when Myanmar look at the West, then of course this is neighborhood always come first to both of them. What we do in, in, in you know in India, the pre-COVID period, there is a you know perception change when you look at the trade. 25% of the India trade in Southeast and East Asia. But India trade in the Myanmar is pretty low and it has been declining. The huge potential, but unlocking those is a big challenge. So I hope the students panel will tell us how to do it. Professor uh, Zhou is here, uh, Professor Mio Min, who is an expert from the ATP, who was driving these things in it. He will share with us their visions. Next is the active vision is there, but, and this is, as I said, the rule based, both India and Myanmar, they look for in the region as also in the globally, the rule based global order. Both, both the countries, they look for maritime connectivity, maritime corporations. That's actually being India, uh, Bay of Bengal, Indian Ocean, and the beyond. Here comes the Japan, where India, Japan, and ASEAN cooperation, the trilateral for quality infrastructure, being discussed presently, supply chain. What I see, QNS, yeah, I think we'll have some more discussion on it, that Myanmar is looking for in India to upscale the relations. So also in India, to looking at Myanmar in trade, commerce, culture, and other areas. And to start with, maybe, uh, the COVID-19 vaccines, the corporations, India has been with the Myanmar, you know, soon after the you know pandemic happened in from the month of February and or March onward, you know, India continuously assisting Myanmar in in taming, in managing, in containing the COVID virus in many ways. So now it comes to the COVID-19 vaccines. So how and which way the, you know it can be extended from India to Myanmar? That's the you know the, we, we, I think this panel will discuss and give some more give some more lights on it. Point five is the unlocking potentials need time to the corporations. There's the ups and down. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. But think tanks, civil society organizations like that we have met today, they have a very strong role. So I have some suggestions that how do we strengthen it in, 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 in terms of you know, trade, connectivity, particularly focusing on the border areas. As you know, that Ambassador Myanmar said this is a normal trade is happening in the MFN. Ambassador Gautam Kupata is very much thorough on the subject. He went ahead in giving a very minute details about it. We, we do not do any more with the positive list basis, but there are many challenges at the border. Our offers many services. Manipur offers services like health, tourism, there are complementarities, but there need to be some state level or central level, some matchmaking, the B2B level. That's what the owner to son, he talked about, the India, Myanmar, business to business, India, Myanmar, ASEAN, Japan, business to business. Those parts are actually the missing, the entrepreneurship, the linking, that's what I found when I do the, you know, you know, the, the survey, uh, uh, when I did the survey. That, and if you look at the trade, the latest one is the downfall. Why? I'll come soon. And if you look at the, the figure, which I just looked at, you know, till the March 2020 figure, you will be amazed that we in 20, 2020, 2015, 2016, when 
you know, we, we allowed the MFN trade to happen at the border, and the total trade was a two billion, and that has come down to one and a half, one point half, the billion trade. So what's going, you know, what's why it is that normally if you go for a trade liberalization, if you improve the connectivity, if you improve trade facilitation, normally trade should go up. And uh, this is pre-COVID. Why it has been down? I think today's panel might, you know, tell us, take some more class. How do we bring back the trade momentum? But that's what the national figure. But what the border areas is telling is completely different. Uh, the blue chart is actually Myanmar export to India. Huge jump, right? India's export is also going, but there is a camouflage in it because we know, you know, when we look at the trade between India and Myanmar. Uh, at the border, there's a huge amount of informality involved. And if we look at the Moret Tamu, which is the point connecting the Tralatal Highway or anything that we do in the Myanmar, uh, and, uh, you, but, but to remind you that Myanmar's trade within India to the border, it's minuscule when it's come. You know, so border trade with India doesn't figure out at all in the Myanmar. There are many reasons. This is the past figure. Uh, a, you know, it is 2016 to 2008 average figure. Don't read much in it. But what I mean to say here that the trade through the border between the two countries yet to take a step. But with Myanmar, with you know China, you know, Thailand, you know there are you know the change in the trade pattern, change in the trade flow and that can happen. Usual again back to the India. If we improve uh, the connectivity part, if we improve the trade facilitation, that's what the in the, you know the, the what is the first session we talked about mostly the informal trade that there is a rise in huge amount of passenger movement at the moment because india has allowed you know the passengers coming and getting in on on you know the visa uh on e-visa coming to the, the border and there is the possibilities for health treatment if a palin will say something about it education and several other things, areas so there is a natural attractions for myanmar coming to the northeastern part of india for tourism health education and this is an area which is growing and perhaps we need to nurture more and more between the two countries to facilitate more and more big challenge uh, which i'll then wind up this is the informality a third country trade which has come without you know proper trade formalities this is a big challenge which is actually discouraging a local industrialization the industry is the money pool in the northeastern part of india or in the Pagain province or maybe in the Chin province, or maybe Mandala subject, all these areas, because of the third country goods and lending here, the local industries, they are missing out. They are unable to, you know, go into the business. Again, this is an informal trade, some pictures, which I picked up last year. What Northeastern India needs, and that's what I think the Buddha Steeler panel will talk about. I give it both the versions. One is that Northeast part, based on my discussion, conversation, Northeast part of India, including Myanmar, Manipur, they look for transport and border connectivity improvement, direct flight, bus service, there are cooperation in health, tourism, education, agriculture. There are issues in the visa. There are issues on in the mutual recognition agreement, acknowledgement, you know, accountants with the degrees and diplomas, etc. There is a need for trade in local currency between chairs and rupee, language schools, visiting scholarships, faculty exchange. So there are lots of things which you know, we can be done. That's what the North is demand. What is the Myanmar is telling us? Myanmar looks for a huge amount of FDI, obviously, Indian entrepreneurships, you know, it's a good attraction for them, just crossing the bay. And so they need higher FDI, but they also tell that Indian supported development projects cannot meet the deadline for various reasons. So there are issues both for the government aided projects and also for the private sector. Myanmar wants to require a greater market access of their goods and services in Professor Pulses. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Zhou will have set some highlight, you know, set some uh, you know, points on these. The Pulses export from Myanmar to India, garments, timber products, higher education, etc. We need to promote this. Myanmar views agro horticulture, value chains, improve connectivity, and cater cooperation in the energy sectors. Very impressed by the Ambassador Kumar, Sir of Kumar's point that yesterday they had a joint working group meeting on this. Uh, these are the discussed, but I'm not going to repeat. This is done, and this is our no more required. Last slide, that is what I will close, that what we can do further. Five points, I place it at the panel for discussion. 
One is that promoting shared cultural relations, strengthening infrastructure linkages, facilitating trade and investment and tourism, and developing human resources, and promoting the environment and promoting the sustainable use of shared natural resources. These are the five areas very much, very much fit into India's active vision and also very much fit into the Myanmar's Act of West. Uh, that's what uh, you know, I was told when they look at in South Asia. So these are the five areas you know, which can take us, our relation to a higher scale. And thank you very much. Thank you. Extremely valuable because going to the Myanmar border in terms of what can be done on both sides. We have three panelists, expert panelists from Myanmar and four from India. And let me, before I introduce the first of the panelists, let me just flag two, three points that came out of the first two uh, uh, you know, presentations. One, I think we still haven't touched or maybe didn't come up. We haven't touched on this whole issue of uh, RC and uh, you know, the, uh, India's not joining or not being able to join the RCP. This is a point that I'm flagging from Mr. Onozawa and Prabhupada Day, perhaps at the end of the discussion. But also in Prabhupada's uh, presentation, I think two sort of slightly contradictory things came up. One is, of course, that overall, you know, this deceleration in trade, uh, what are the reasons for that? Again, I don't think we can expect experts on border trade to be able to give us an answer to that. This is something that has to come at a more macro level. But at the border level as well, we see a contradiction that on the one hand, there is a great increase in trade that is visible, but that is actually all this trade is now informal trade and there is very little formal trade. Uh, so, you know, and, you know, of course, it compares very poorly with the border trade through Thailand and particularly with China. And the reasons for that are very clear. It is mainly because the Northeast, which is naturally bountiful and Western Myanmar, which is also naturally bountiful, are not adequately developed to have large exportable products. So I think really 90% of the problem is not just connectivity, it is also local productivity and investment in the local economies that has been missing. And it would be particularly nice if that cross investment took place, uh, you know, uh, between Indian business and Myanmar business, or let's say widely ASEAN business, helped by countries like Japan and Korea and, uh, you know, other more developed countries. So our first expert panelist Why? Uh, is Dr. Mio. Sorry. Some problem? Yeah, sorry. Dr. Mio Thant. Uh, Dr. Mio Thant is the founder and chief economist of the Parami Roundtable Think Tank and senior advisor to the Myanmar Institute of Strategic and International Studies. Uh, uh, very well known to, I think, many of us. Uh, Dr. Mio Thant, I have the pleasure to invite you to make your presentation. Please try to limit yourself to about six minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon to everybody. I'd like to thank the conference organizers for inviting me to this meeting. It's good to see old friends. Prabir is there. And meet new colleagues. In the interest of time, allow me to go straight to the heart of my presentation. Now, in my opinion, the Eavri Biyamaputra River Based Regional Cooperation has four interlinked major components. And we should keep that in mind. One, is Northeast India. Two is non-Northeast India-based cooperation, such as Calcutta to Yangon or Delhi to Napier or Lynx. Number three, economic or transport corridors, which make strategic use of Myanmar's geographically strategic location, such as the India-Myanmar-Thailand trilateral highway or the Kaladan River corridor. And the fourth, and certainly not least, uh, a component of India-Myanmar cooperation is ASEAN++ plus plus agreements and the forthcoming RCEP. And that is coming, we don't know if it's this year, next year or when, but it is, I think, coming. So all of this is historically recent. I mean, it's uh, the past, I've been listening to the Look East India uh, idea started around 1991. Uh, the, the concrete uh, proposal started around 2005. So that's not too long ago. They're recent, they're wonderful. And in many cases, economic, logistic, academic, and cultural projects have already delivered mutually beneficial uh, outcomes. As a Myanmar citizen, I must both thank and congratulate India for its vision and generosity. I also believe that a golden age of cooperation is just around the corner. However, having said that, almost after almost 30 years of practical experience in regional cooperation in all parts of Asia, as well as other parts of the world, the my experience forces me to be a bit more cautious. 
Asia and Africa are littered with unsuccessful regional, regional cooperation experiments. And even when it's successful, it takes huge amounts of time, money, mutual understanding, determination, and the right combination of public-private partnerships to achieve success. If we are to make genuine progress in the near future, ladies and gentlemen, we need to be brutally honest about outstanding problems in four areas, not including law and order and security, which is a different, different category, which I won't go into. I'm an economist, not a, not a diplomat or any, any of these things. But I think even without the law and order situation, we have four issues that we need to look at. The first one is physical connectivity. The second one is what is usually called soft infrastructure or institutions and policies governing regional cooperation. The third is actual realization of net economic benefits and the distribution of these benefits between different actors and states. I realize that that's a fairly long statement. So let me repeat again, because I've been saying this for over the past 25 years, and it has been given short shrift until the recent debacle in EU. So let me repeat again, actual realization of net economic benefits and the distribution of these benefits between different actors and states. And the fourth point is people to people cooperation, which different people have uh, said already. Now I submit that there are problems in each of these four major areas. The 100 page 2016 paper by a person called Dr. Das, I think from the Indian government, does a good job of discussing the challenges from the Indian perspective. And if a similar report were to be prepared by the Myanmar side, another 20 pages could probably easily add it. So I won't do that. Anybody wants to see what the, most of the problems are, you can refer to the, the DAS paper of 2016. And also the, our ambassador, the Myanmar ambassador has already said that the volumes have gone down. The basket of goods is traded has also gone down and there are some other issues as well. So in the interest of time, I have six minutes. So let me recommend six short-term actions that we can, we can consider. Number one is, and complete the remaining infrastructure required for physical connectivity by 2021 or 22. As one of my engineer colleagues, he who likes to needle me, likes to point out no transport, no trade. So no matter how many good theories I have in economics, without the transport, you have no trade. Simple as that. Number two, improve physical facilities at major border crossings to enable year-round economic activity. And here, I think the word is year-round. The weather, the climate in that part of the world is very, very brutal. Okay, rainy season, you have no activity as well. So at, as Dr. Day, previous uh, pictures show, things haven't really improved. It's still very, very rudimentary in the border crossings. So we have to build warehouses. We have to have proper tr truck terminals, which have good environmental conditions. Okay, electricity, safe water and sanitation, etc. So these things have to be done. Where the money for that will come, I have no idea, but they have to be done. A third point is improve border crossing procedures. And there are four sub issues here. One of the first one is adopt the single window procedures which are now being used in almost all ASEAN countries. I think single, single window has been used in all, all, all countries except Myanmar. And conceptually we have, we know how to do it. And also we also have plenty of lessons on how not to do it from the other ASEAN countries. So why can't we do this? Improve SPS sanitary and phytosanitary procedures and facilities, such as labs, laboratories, since much of the trade will be food related items, lentils, rice, tea, etc. So you have to do that to prevent negative externalities from occurring and also uh, epidemics, or uh, zoonotic uh, issues. Number three, implement efficient cross-border labor and population movement protocols while addressing concerns about illegal migration. Now, I don't know which country fears illegal migration more, Myanmar or India, but every time you talk to non-economists or non-transport people or non-people who haven't really bought into this ARD Chauvia, sorry, ARD Brahmaputra cooperation scheme, they will raise this issue of illegal migration or, Ill or illegal movement of illegal persons. So what you have to do is not only come up with an efficient protocol, for normal people or legal people, but how to deal effectively with the illegal ones as well. And final point is to deal effectively with smuggling and rent seeking activities, which is easier said than done, but is necessary for fiscal reasons, as well as ensuring fair competition. 
There's a huge amount of rent seeking, self-serving behavior at the borders. Let's be honest. And to deal with that, you need strong policies either at the local level, not either at the local level, but at the local level supported by the government from the central level as well. It's not easy to do. Both sides also also prepare. And the fourth uh, suggestion I have is that both sides should prepare an annual quote unquote ease of doing business report card to provide a common basis for moving ahead. Okay, this is done in ASEAN. It's, um, it's a fairly, and I don't suggest the same sort of uh, long document which becomes an exercise in its own right, but I think it's fairly important that both sides are involved. Number five, policies are frequently more important, difficult than projects to implement. So start work on the following three policy issues which have been shown to be complex and time consuming matters in other regional cooperation programs. The first one is, okay, road safety and minimizing overweighting of trucks. Unfortunately, newer, um, newer roads is associated with more deaths. Okay, and this is, a, this is, we've seen all over Southeast Asia and you've seen it even in Myanmar as well. Okay, okay. number two, some sort of cross-border transport agreement to minimize transport co costs and time is ne needed. My, from my own experience, I, I was working um, on the cross-border transport agreement for, a, for the GMS, the Greater Mekong Subregion in I think 1997. I left in 2015 and they were still working on this issue. So these things take a long time, but at least we have some lessons, positive and negative to learn from other countries in the GMS, as well as what we call the Central Asian Republic uh, Economic Cooperation. A third point is a transit fee agreement. I haven't seen, I haven't come across any discussion on this. I am not sure what the Galadang Corridor Agreement is or whether one even exists, but you will need one. Believe me, if you want to really use the Indian, India, Myanmar, Thailand uh, corridor to get to, uh, to other parts of Southeast Asia. Now, again, you don't have to start from scratch. There's plenty of this uh, sort of stuff that we see in, in the EU as well. And finally, and this is a point that everybody has mentioned. So this is my final point. Get people to know each other by holding annual trade fairs and study tours, especially between Infal, Kohima and Dimapur on one side and major towns in Zagain, Mandalay and Chin regions. My view is that this, is, this will result not only in more trade and investment opportunities, but will also create a deep and lasting basis of support for further cooperation between the peoples of the two countries. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Myothant, for a very crisp presentation. Uh, uh, an excellent practical menu of suggestions that can, I think, quite easily be implemented. Uh, I just want to sort of flag one thing that uh, we also have, I think, an agreed but not signed motor vehicle agreement between India, Myanmar, and Thailand, you know, which is supposed to be uh, to work with the trilateral highway. Uh, but again, I, if anyone can enlighten us on the status, why exactly the signing is stuck, it would be helpful. I suspect that somewhere at the back of the mind, it is the issue that you raised about illegal migration and the protocols that are required. But again, it's a very, a very, very practical point. Thank you very much for your presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Zo Wu. Uh, Dr. Zo Wu is another extremely highly qualified expert, uh, executive director of the Center for Economic and Social Development and Independent Think Tank, dedicated to the inclusive development of Myanmar. His list of achievements is very long. Uh, he has been a presidential economic advisor from 2012 to 16, uh, and also has served as principal advisor to several uh, ministries on, other, on various other issues. He has contributed to the framework of economic and social reform, a strategic policy framework that guided, guided Myanmar's economic reforms, reforms and also negotiations with the Paris Club in the cancellation of Myanmar's debt. Uh, presently, he's a member of the National uh, Minimum Wage Setting Committee and also uh, you know, someone who has had uh, experience and uh, training at Harvard University and Turin University. Presently, he's he also taught at Chiang Mai University between 2006 and 11. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ambassador Gautam. Uh, it's very good to see you again. And I also like to thank uh, Asian Confluence uh, for inviting me to speak at this very uh, important uh, discussions. And um, I would like to actually be a bit more uh, interactive with uh, what uh, other experts have already uh, discuss and especially my senior colleague Dr. Mutan has uh, laid down a very uh, 
a good roadmap uh, for what uh, two countries can consider. So I would rather pick on uh, a few issues that uh, he hasn't uh, highlighted. Uh, perhaps I like to pick up what uh, Dr. Prabhi has already emphasized that um, Myanmar has a uh, uh, long borders with both India and China, and also Thailand. And on, on the side of China and Thailand, we do have a huge uh, border trade. Uh, it's it's uh, also going through the very vibrant and uh, uh, very active uh, border trade zones. And uh, to compare with the, what's happening in China, Myanmar, and, in China, and Thailand, Myanmar border, I think... Uh, uh, India Myanmar border seems to be quite, uh, you know, as uh, what uh, Burby has, uh, you know, used a photo from the NASA. It's it's a very dark uh, area. So uh, let let us uh, work together to make it uh, brighter and uh, more vibrant uh, from from now onward. Uh, of course, I think that Dr. Mewtan is uh, quite correct in saying it's uh, without the transport and uh, physical infrastructure it will be very difficult for us to uh, see any uh, trade uh, between the two countries. But uh, perhaps uh, we, have to, we have to start from where we, where we have. Um, actually, uh, there are already some sort of uh, uh, cross-border trade, especially uh, most of the agriculture uh, goods have been flowing from Myanmar to India. Uh, so maybe perhaps this is something uh, which uh, uh, two uh, authorities can uh, enhance the border trade through the trade uh, facilitations. I think um, Dr. Onzawa has also mentioned about the, the trade facilitation as a, as a key uh, task for the two uh, governments to enhance uh, border trade between the two countries. Um, because I, I, I'm saying this mainly because, you know, uh, Prabhi has already mentioned that uh, from 2017 onwards, there was a sudden drop of uh, bilateral trade. Uh, as you all know, it was uh, caused by the government of India's, uh, you, know, uh, re uh, you know, issuing of the new regulatory uh, uh, quantitative restrictions on the passes uh, the, the lentils, the legumes uh, from Myanmar to India, I, which, uh, you know, used to occupy about, um, you know, 800 to 1 billion uh, trade worth of uh, export from Myanmar to India. Now it uh, is uh, less than 300 uh, million US dollars. So uh, it, it's supposed to take up, uh, pick up uh, some sort of a momentum, but uh, until unless the government of India can um, reconsider the uh, quantitative restrictions on the passes trade, uh, there is no way that uh, uh, our bilateral trade can actually pick up uh, any uh, momentum. So I would uh, like to use this opportunity to also appeal to the uh, Government of India authorities to reconsider about uh, um, about the uh, quantitative restrictions on the passes trade. I, I'm actually advocating for this uh, mainly because you know, in the light of what happened in COVID-19, uh, the countries are now forced to prepare to mitigate any sort of uh, supply chain disruptions. Um, and uh, as uh, Banzer Gautam has just emphasized that the, uh, you know, uh, be behind the trade, there, there must always be an uh, investment. And maybe perhaps uh, this is a time that uh, the India must consider investing more in Myanmar, uh, mainly because I'm saying this because I, in, in the recent years, India has been investing quite a bit of uh, agriculture plantations in, in uh, Africa and to grow some of the lentils and the passes in the, you know, Northeast uh, Africa, just to expo uh, import some sort of uh, lentils that uh, India is in, in need of. Um, in, in fact, most of these lentils, uh, passes something like a pigeon peas, 
and black grams are the things that Myanmar has been exporting to India for, for many years. So maybe uh, for the sake of uh, managing the supply chains, uh, which is uh, much better to manage a shorter supply chain and that the supply chain that is uh, no barrier between the countries. And Myanmar actually uh, provides uh, the best location advantage for India investor to do any sort of agriculture investment so that they can actually uh, import uh, back to India. So maybe perhaps if you think of uh, agriculture value chains and linking between the two countries, perhaps through the land-based uh, cross-border uh, connectivity, maybe a very good solution um, in, in the wake of what's happening in the COVID-19 and also uh, in the light of uh, what the two countries can actually have a long-term um, um, uh, arrangement uh, for such trade. Um, I also wanted to touch on the, 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 the one uh, particular aspect of uh, the border trade. And then when I actually take a look at the what's going on at the uh, India Myanmar border, and then there was a one product that stands out very outstanding. And so we are actually exporting a lot of betel nuts to India. And then uh, unfortunately, starting from the 2017, uh, we also saw that there was a restrictions on the betel nut, and then there was a huge drop, uh, even though the betel nuts only uh, is about the $20 million a trade. So maybe perhaps uh, if we can't tackle on the larger passes trade, why not we can start, uh, you know, uh, negotiating on how to make a stable betel nut trade across the border. Maybe perhaps this is something that the trade officials from the both sides of the border can really take a look and then maybe try to find out the ways to uh, enhance it. So maybe I think these are the, some of the uh, practical projects that uh, maybe two governments can consider. Um, uh, to, to answer the ambassador question about the duty-free trade preferences scheme, DFTP, as far as I know, uh, we haven't realized a lot of benefits from it because uh, most of the products uh, are still in the exclusion list of uh, government of India. So maybe perhaps uh, if there's a chance that we should also look into it and then see how uh, investment-led uh, trade might be able to uh, address the issue. And um, so I think uh, my, my time is up, so I would just leave it here. And then uh, I wanted to give it back to Ambassador Gautam for your intervention. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Zou, and great to see you again. Uh, before I turn to Dr. Myo Myo Min, uh, let me just make two quick comments on your presentation. Firstly, on the DFTP, uh, it was a phased reduction uh, of tariffs. And as of now, after the completion of the five years phase reduction, it is literally 99.4%. There's virtually only a negative list left. And those negative lists are mostly you know, the kind of things like cigarettes, alcohol, and so on. But uh, really now, uh, it is a pretty open thing. It's just that there is a great lack of awareness on both sides about the scheme, even though it is officially up on the uh, you know, Directorate of Foreign Trade uh, website on the Indian side. Secondly, I'm very glad that you brought up the issue of beans and pulses and also uh, beetle nut. You know, it's a classic case of uh, harming ourselves uh, because at the time of the economic liberalization in Myanmar in 2011, India, in spite of sanctions, in spite of very poor connectivity, India was the third largest trade partner of yeah. Myanmar. Uh, through, uh, you know, democracy and, uh, you know, repression, uh, this remained. And the value of roughly 1 million tons of beans and pulses was 1 billion US dollars, yeah. just give or take. And yeah. the value of rice exports to China, much higher volumes, yeah. was not quite the same. So, Beans and pulses, and at that time, timber as well, was, was more than just a commodity trade transaction. It was actually the foundation of, in many ways, our relationship. Because behind the beans and pulses producers were farmers. So it was a relationship that was between the farmers and the buyers of, of India. Uh, so I really think that we need to look at this from a much more, you know, uh, of a much more, uh, from a very different lens. And betel nut has similarly suffered. Actually, betel nut suffered in the transition from border trade 
where it had duty concessions to most favored nation trade, where the duties are the same for every country. So Myanmar has lost the benefit of the duty concession that it had on border trade. So, you know, I think when we make these transitions, we need to see who and what we are hurting and also make allowances uh, for that. So I'll just leave it at that point. And I'm sorry for taking up time to, to make these points because I think these are really, really important commodities in our, in our trade. Uh, Dr. Mint, my apologies for coming in the way of your uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Mint is a PhD in economics graduate from the University of Malaya, co-founder of the Center for of Economy, Environment and Society, the CES, uh, based out of Yangon in Myanmar, a development professional and economist with 20 years of experience, 10 years of program management experience in Myanmar, and she's worked in a whole series of sort of policy uh, formulation and policy advocacy areas, institutional development and regional and local in, in, uh, integration, uh, covers things like SME development, industrial zone development, and uh, you know a, a number of other subjects, sectoral investments, I think of particularly great value in terms of the kinds of commodities on the Indian side and Myanmar side that can be developed for cross inter-country inter and cross-border trade. Uh, I invite you to make your presentation. Thank you very much. So, so there are quite a lot of things happening and I see at the same time there's a lot of quite a lot to be done from policy change to hard infrastructure development. Also like I see there are various steps to be taken from micro, meso and um, macro level. Also on our previous speakers I learned that you know uh, that uh, setting up a border huts is it is considered as a matter of importance. This is this is very good for the social economic development for both local uh, for local people from both sides that they can join benefits from the development. Also, need just to say that India has always been an important country for Myanmar. Similarly, Myanmar has been an important trade exchange center for India because it is the only you know, uh, country in South Asia that uh, be a land bridge between India and South Asia. So since other speakers, uh, they talk about infrastructures and others, you know, the development. So I will go straight for uh, informal sector. So we've been talking a lot about the border trade. So Myanmar has border trade with four out of five border countries. There are four uh, trade border posts uh, between Myanmar and China, and then seven border posts between Myanmar and Thailand, and then three in the three border posts, Myanmar and India, and then another three from between Myanmar and Bangladesh border. So between Myanmar and, uh, Myanmar and India, there are three, uh, three major border trade groups, Mandalay, Sakai, and Chin, so with North East India since 2017. So we've been talking a lot about uh, trade promotion and you know, uh, trade promotion uh, along the border area. So I think here we should be noted that you know, when we talk about uh, 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 trade between Myanmar and India, so the role of informal sector cannot be neglected. Because also it leads very much and recorded trade data and statistics. It is very important for both, uh, both governments for the policy formulation to formalize the informal sector. So also Excellency mentioned about the trade volume and amounts. In fact, the actual trade may be more than that because of the informal trade and, and recorded data. Also, there has been a suspen uh, substantial increase in informal trade in the last two years. And former bilateral trade between India and Myanmar has begun almost, um, uh, almost, um, um, almost, uh, how to say, uh, very low. Uh, actually, trade between uh, the former data is compared to information is very low. So there are a lot of push and pull factors, and because also some of the I, I see some of the question uh, came out from the participants that the constraints uh, about the COVID actually. I like to highlight a lot of, because the previous speakers, they mentioned about opportunities and a lot of developments. Now I like to mention about the constraints to improve trade between the two countries. So like there are several, uh, this is several official, uh, official efforts uh, uh, <clears throat> in order to in place, you know, increase formal trade links between Myanmar and India. But still, cost of formal trade is a major concern for Informal uh, traders, that's the reason a lot of people go for informal trade. Also, there are a lot of time consuming and inefficient formal export import procedures and regulations. They are now, um, 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 
um, Ministry of Commerce, you know, they are really improving, uh, improving the you know format system. But still, there are a lot of constraints, uh, time consuming, you know, to apply for export import procedures in the border area. Also, as uh, you know, that Dr. Saul mentioned, there's still very high duty for some products. For example, like BitNet is a problem. BitNet's problem is a very good example for us to uh, to reconsider our uh, new policy uh, policy issues between two countries. Also, they are like uh, actually they are like a lot of you know uh, projects, uh, major projects are still prohibited in uh, both sides. For example, like fertilizer. And then some, uh, for sometimes what happened between uh, two countries in the border area is that sometimes you know the informal products in Myanmar uh, becomes formal products in India. Sometimes you know uh, illegal products in India. One day, you know, import, uh, export to Myanmar, it becomes a uh, legal product. So it makes a lot of out to the data differences between formal and informal trade. That makes it very difficult for the policy maker to, to, to do specific policy reform for the specific product. Also, still, like, still, we, we still need, like, like, kind of, like, a kind of, like, a more transparent measure. Measure and then clear rules and responsibilities of both custom, uh, you know, custom uh, side. Also, like simplifying for my operation process. Now there's a lot of improvement, but still, when the last last year, November, I had the chance to meet with a lot of traders in the border area, particularly from Chin and uh, Chin at uh, India. So the thing is, like, they really would like to go to formal formal operation process, yeah, but so they really don't know how to do formalize their uh, business. So because of the like uh, complicated uh, custom procedure makes them, you know, to go for the informal sector. Also, they think that they, uh, they are like uh, improving uh, financial services, but still they are still uh, don't want to use formal financial services that they need to be improved. Also, like both sides. Not only the COVID period, even before COVID period, you know, because of the instable uh, like policy and regulations from both countries, so they are you know frequently closed border gate from both sides. Uh, sometimes you know border gates are closed a couple of weeks, so uh, that made uh, difficult for the traders, you know, to predict they are uh, they are like how to the future they are export and import you know uh, import uh, 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 time frame. So like uh, that's why we are thinking like there are a lot of things to be done and then a lot of things can be done. So like between for example, like uh, 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 the specific we can there are a lot of like there are a lot of study mentioned about the specific products for example between India and Myanmar for example like fertilizer, bitterness, also agricultural products. So we can we can pick up specific products that which are most trading between two countries, and then we can look at trading policy for those uh, specific products. Also, also we can, at the same time, we can also consider the role of trade products in the informal sector. What should be done to formalize the informal sector between two, uh, between two countries for this uh, prominent uh, uh, trade uh, trading product? Also, like in, investment from in, uh, India, in, India in Myanmar is also improving, but, uh, but, but uh, no, trade, uh, trade, uh, trade activities are still not linked with much with the investment activities. Also, need we need more capital investment to go to formal trade. Also, Dr. Zou mentioned to consider investment-led trade. For the time being, look like you know investment and investment activities and trade uh, trade activities are not uh, not uh, significantly implemented each other. So we need to strengthen between trade trade activities and investment activities to go along together. Also, we see that we need to enhance foreign markets to be connected with their domestic larger markets. Because in, in, in Myanmar, they have a, a very big domestic, a large domestic market, but foreign markets are still not much connected to this, you know, a domestic a larger market. I think setting up the border hubs may be helpful in the future. Also, I mentioned that like Myanmar and India, they can improve administrative infrastructure at the custom post and a trade facilitation and support institutions in border trade areas. So we need more trade posts and supporting institutions because some of the like also, like you can look at, you know, some of the border trade uh, 
are, are busy, some are not, not so busy. So you can think of, you can think of, you know, which border posts are the most busy area, and then you can get some more, you know, you can, you can get like, you can, you can get some more uh, trade post for the easier trade facilitation process for the traders. Also, as I mentioned, that like final improvement of financial institutions they are needed. So a lot of people are still informal informal money transferring system. If you can do formalize, you know, for a uh, formalized uh, you know, uh, financial uh, financial uh, system, that will be very helpful. Also, I think it will be a win-win situation. Like for example, like uh, collecting tax and then like between uh, easier to understand, you know, trade volume and then a trade amount between two countries are through from this financial, you know, payment system. But the timing you really cannot know because we have like, I know, recorded trade data, but they are a lot of informal sector are using a lot of informal payment system. If you have uh, really have, you know, formal financial system, that will help uh, a lot for the for both country. Also, like I mentioned, there are a lot of, so when we met with uh, traders in uh, Chin State, there are a lot of like kind of, uh, kind of uh, trading uh, products, for example, like fertilizer and the like edible oil and the salt animal feed and cosmetics, garments, station, uh, stationary uh, home appliances. We can think of, like, as I mentioned, we can think of, think of, you know, which products are the most traded items and then think of which specific policy can, can you know, promote this uh, traded item. Because of most of the, these items are more like kind of uh, the most traded items, but they are, they are most in the informal sector. That's why we should think of this as uh, the most uh, tradable items in, in the informal sector to formalize in the inf uh, formal sector, uh, to, to improve in the formal sector. The previous the speaker mentioned that there are road conditions, like, you know, that people particularly, particularly the Calais too, uh, roads are, they are, you know, need to be improved. Also between Calais and Rwanda, they are, are, are specific in the monsoon area. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's and the previous speaker mentioned that. that uh, so the particularly the particularly that what can be done is we can think of one is linear policy because I'm with, within my uh, capacity we are thinking a lot lo a lot about the policy reform. So particularly for the trade policy reform. So I think the first uh, first thing is like you, we can look at you know various uh, project linked to uh, linked to uh, uh, specific policy and then particularly for the uh, duty and tax between two uh, uh, between two countries. Also you you can look at you know some prohibited uh, products that are much traded uh, between two countries can be think about that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for turning the attention to the informal trade and the informal sector. And I think this is an issue and not only that, also the need to disaggregate trade, the need for trade literacy, trade education, the need for financial mechanisms. I think these are all very, very relevant points. And I think these are issues that concern, I think a lot of our Indian uh, panelists here very much. And Dr. I know that uh, uh, Professor Prioranjan has been devoting quite a long time to that together with uh, the Moiva University, between Manipur University and Moiva University. But our first speaker, I think now we have about 22 minutes of our time left. So, uh, you know, with my due apologies, I'll have to request our Indian panelists to be, to be crisp and quick. Uh, my our first, and I will also shorten the introductions to some extent. Our first Indian panelist is uh, uh, Dr. Ibohal Mete. Uh, Dr. Ibohal Mete is a professor of management and director at the Center for Entrepreneurship and Skill Development at Manipur University. Uh, Dr. Mete, I invite you to take the floor. Thank you, sir, respected uh, chairperson, Sri Gautam Mukhopadhyay, distinguished panelists, esteemed participants, ladies and gentlemen, a very Good afternoon, you, you all. In fact, uh, uh, many dimensions uh, have been discussed as for the development of the border areas as a part of India-Myanmar cooperation and as a program of Brahmaputra Iravati dialogue, which can bring some sort of a vibrant and prosperous border zones neighboring between the two countries. Uh, well. Uh, 
As for me, I'm in a graduation. Just I would like to put across a certain point which we can touch upon for the policy changes and other measures which we can be taken up for the benefits of border countries. In fact, India, because of her geopolitical and other economic reasons, she has to develop a good relationship with Myanmar and beyond. And for that matter, not only this bilateral relationship, Myanmar has to be taken care of for the mutual development and as a part of the BIMSTAN, as a part of ASEAN as a whole. Now to the point as for the trade, I, uh, I just would like to just give one, uh, just in a sense in more Tamu sector happening. Because when it has been normalized, almost the trade is reduced to zero because the tariff structure has been changed dramatically. The major trade happening between these two uh, counterparts, this point, is a battle nuts, as already been discussed. That's why this tariff structure has to be taken care of. And another is that as it has been normalized, any kind of a goods which are not falling in the negative list can be traded. Maybe the products from other countries, third party origin, if there is a certification for that, that cannot be uh, operationalized. That is one. The infrastructure facilities available in Moray Tabu sector, though it has been developed uh, to great extent, but still we do not have a proper connectivity of EDI. That's why whatever the product coming for trading, it cannot be accessed. It doesn't have the access code. That's why there is so much of you know this one problem in the harmonizing this kind of a trade. So that's uh, one infrastructure facilities. That's why. To cut short, we can just compare the kind of facilities happening with Myanmar and China in the Musei, Myanmar and Thailand in Mayabadi Masson, and Myanmar, India, especially in the Moreta Mus sector. So that's why there is an acute shortage of infrastructural facilities. That's to be addressed. Then at the same time, we need to redress our own warehousing and transport within our own countries. That means uh, the kind of a transport facilities which we are having is not up to the mark. Big lorries cannot fly. All weather roads are not, you know, connecting properly. So that's why these are the things for the trade. And at the same time, we can think about the better, robust kind of a, a, a border zones to be developed. People to people connectivity is very important. So for Myanmar, they have started e-visa facilities and the Moray Tamu sector has been uh, recognized as a immigration point. But for India, uh, we are supposed to give the e-visa facilities for the Myanmar nations. So that is some sort of a, you know, this difficulties are there. That's why movement for the health, tourism, education, and various other uh, trade related things that has to be smoothened and properly channelized. That is uh, one part we just I observe uh, from my experiences. And at the same time, what we have to do is so many uh, policy changes need to be decided as for the cross border trucking, single window clearance, is the ASEAN nations are doing. One of the you know, speakers, Mr. Uh, Miotan, had already explained that can be extended. Yes, if we have that kind of a motor vehicle agreement between the two countries, including Thailand, that is to be appreciated. But my observation over here, we have so much of prospects for collaborations at the university's level. We have so much of areas for the skill development, mutual ratios, so on and so forth. We had already invited a team of Myanmar scholars for an educational exposure in Manipur University. We provided some sort of a collaborative exchange of educational and other uh, industry related things. But now, the one important strategic agenda which we have to sit with, Myanmar is having two important industrial parks. One is in Mayotha, Mayotha Industrial Park in Myanmar. Another is in Talewa, that is in uh, Yangon. And 
the Sagaing region where Manipur is neighboring with Myanmar, they are also having their small, small industrial states, industrial zones, four industrial zones they are having. But if we would truly commit it for developing these border zones, we are supposed to see some sort of a special economic zones develop in border areas, depending, uh, keeping in view the raw material and other resources available in that area. That's why I would like to draw the attention of uh, investors from Japan, JICA, or whatever. They are maybe investing in some infrastructure facilities, roads, etc., etc. That's to be highly appreciated. But at the same time, I would like to draw the attention for investing in some of the sectors where the participation from the Japanese gun companies can also be increased with the local workforces or local level industrial units in a joint venture setup, whatever feasible. Maybe in the healthcare, maybe in the services, maybe in the IT, maybe in the processing, maybe in the pharmaceutical, maybe in any other areas where this Myanmar person and the Indian person is having a quite lot of a uh, biodiversity hotspot zone. So this is a one opportunity I see to it. That's why when we see to it this one, uh, Mayotta is uh, near this Irabadi Bank, Mayotta Industrial Park. They have a river port. And then if you just go down, it will go to Yangon. If you take a U-turn from that Mayotta, that Simekong port, and it will go to Chinwin River, and then it will come up to Kalimio. And Kalimio is a hardly uh, 100, 100, 130, 140 kilometers from Moretam. And then Kalimio is having one, one uh, airport that is the uh, middle of the city. That's why they are planning to ship it somewhere. If they ship it a little closer to Tamu site than uh, 30, 40 kilometers, then it again will be becoming much closer to Mori. And that way, the border areas, people residing over there, they can have a, a different kind of a change in their livelihood and in their living standard by putting some sort of a special economic zones, maybe for the food processing, maybe for the uh, uh, agricultural packaging, maybe for the jewelries, furniture, or any other item which is feasible. Uh, that is the uh, one area we can just think about. So that's why uh, I do not know about the uh, seatway ports. It's good, India government has taken up, it is going to be personalized. But to my understanding, one more challenge we have to sit with. Just a few kilometers down south from Sidway, there is a chuck field. Both are situated in the Rakhine region of Myanmar. I, I, I think Rakhine is a little bit uh, volatile in a place, and I don't know how far it will be quite feasible in the years to come. Let's hope for the best. It is coming up. But China is also just investing in, in, in Chuck Pew and they getting access to the, this one, Bay of Bengal, and they are making uh, super highways and including the, uh, uh, the bullet trains from Kunming to Mandalay, Mandalay to Chuck Pew. So that's the kind of a plan they have already taken up. So for India to have a closer and a seamless kind of a connectivity, what could be the other options that we are supposed to say to it? And for that matter, we have many other options, maybe in the Jakarta of, you know, uh, this one, uh, Mijoram, and uh, some other points in Nagaland. However, of these very points, even uh, among the Manipur, there is a one, Beijing, etc., Beijing, Mori Tamu is still considered to be the most feasible and quite good operational, uh, operationally uh, convenient place as on that. So that's why whatever is the connectivity, maybe for the physical connectivity, and then maybe for, for the air connectivity between Imphal and Mandalay, that needs to be met proper attention. Of course, for the uh, land connectivity, our Honorable uh, Ambassador has already uh, explained due to COVID, could not be expedited, then hopefully once the situation improves, it will be operationalized. So that is a good uh, thing. But still, we want air connectivity also. That's uh, with Myanmar. That is the uh, uh, nearest uh, is uh, Mandalay or the Kalimio. So that's why this is, these are some of the things which we can just see to it. 
And whatever is the developmental things to happen with that kind of a connectivity and other things coming in, yes, we need to situate our people residing in the in both sides of the border. So that's why the productivity of the people that is uh, emphasized by our honorable uh, chairperson, Mr. Gordon Mukopada, that's very true. That's why the need of the hour for the both the border areas is to provide right kind of a skill development and entrepreneurial ecosystem in this area, keeping in view the available resources, maybe for the agriculture, maybe for the tourism, maybe for the IT, maybe for the pharmaceutical, healthcare, cement, whatever. So that's why we require our own people to be well equipped with the kind of a skill development. And for that matter, any kind of a industry and uh, good training to happen, we require investment, the, the, the capital. So that's why we, we, we just uh, would love to see some sort of a investment or foreign direct uh, investment, wherever feasible, so that both sides of the people can be benefited in terms of employment generation, in terms of economic livelihood of their people, and the true developmental things be happen and probably in the days to come, this noticing part and Manipur in general could be the true gateway of India to Myanmar and other Southeast Asian countries. These are the few points I, I just would like to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ibohan Mepe. Thank you also for flagging you know, a new idea about the special economic zones. Uh, but of course, special economic zones are usually export oriented. And we also want to see the development of the regions themselves. So uh, in, in the case of uh, China on the China-Myanmar border, they're actually working on border economic zones, uh, which are not necessarily only export oriented. So we could keep that in mind, but also thank you for flagging the issue of the collapse of formal trade on account of the transition from, uh, from, uh, uh, from border trade to MFN trade. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Priyoranjan Singh, also from Manipur University. Uh, he's the professor of econo economics there, and I think you know his appearance at this stage is particularly timely because what we have seen is that actually we know what are the problems and we know what is to be done. And the question that really needs to be answered is if we know what are the problems and what needs to be done, why are they not being done? And perhaps the answer uh, lies in uh, political economy. And Professor Priyoranjan Singh is, amongst other things, his interests are in a political economy of development, agricultural economics, and border trade. And perhaps he has done more than anyone else that I know in bringing about much greater uh, articulation, awareness, research, uh, and I think advocacy. You know, really, he's been a very active uh, uh, you know, person in this area, active academic, in trying to bring about policy changes, uh, both at the state level as well as at the central level. So perhaps, Professor Pioranjan, you are best placed to answer the tough question. Why are things not happening? The floor is yours. I'm sorry that we have just barely 18 minutes or 17 minutes towards the end, and we still have Dr. Palin and Dr. Chipchandra Singh. So uh, with sort of great regret, I have to ask you to be uh, quick. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Gautam, and thank you, everybody. I shall make my presentation very brief, but as desired by... Uh, the chair, Ambassador Gautam, I would stick to the points that you have flagged. See? Our seminar is about uh, development cooperation between Myanmar and Northeastern India and India, with special focus on borderlands. On borderlands, this is one. Then the second issue is what are the challenges that we are facing that we are not with that our trade is going down, formal trade not happening. What are the challenges? Who are responsible for that? And what are the opportunities? Right? And then the third issue is about, can we have new institutional mechanisms and new narrative? Okay? Whereby the issues faced by Myanmar as well as Northeast India can be understood. You know? Do we have a framework, a new narrative, whereby on the third issue that you flagged, what are the new institutional mechanisms that we can bring together so that 
the problems and the opportunities can be properly you know, used by both Northeast India and Myanmar. Now here, the first thing that we need to know is India's foreign policy. You know better. India's foreign policy has now changed. It is seeking for global presence, as a result of which India's active policy is now essentially an Asian, Asia Pacific issue, so that ASEAN has, is becoming merely a stepping stone, even though ASEAN is central to our global ambitions. That is one. Then, uh, secondly, India's active policy, what is India's active policy and what is India's latest stand? That is where you made a pertinent uh, point of what happened to RECP. India has withdrawn from the RECP. And now uh, India thinks that we cannot have these deficits any longer, 109 you know, uh, billion uh, debt with these RECP people, countries, we cannot have that. We cannot have our manufacturing not protected. You know? So India is becoming protectionist, isn't it? And that is, I believe, one reason why India and Myanmar's trade has suffered in many ways. This is one. Then, uh, the, it, this has been highlighted on trade. What is India government's thinking? Let us go to Niti Aayog's, uh, you know, the think tank of India. What does it say? Those countries with, with whom we have signed FTAs, we have not done any better in terms of trade with other people with whom we have not signed these FTAs. This is number one. Number two, you see, uh, our, our exports are determined mainly by uh, uh, incomes and demand and not by tariff or prices. Okay, so this is the new thinking. In other words, India is now becoming lukewarm. And if we remember the Asian, this uh, back, uh, Delhi Declaration of 2018, isn't it? India now emphasizes on maritime, terrorism, you know, connectivity and merchandise trade has been sidelined. This is the reality of India government's, uh, uh, this thing, uh, real uh, foreign policy stance. Now, about the issue of this uh, trade between um, Myanmar and India. Now, neither Myanmar nor Northeast India, nor India, as a macro plan, okay, to normalize trade, number one. Neither do Myanmar nor Northeastern India have any, you know, policy or thought on economic livelihoods, on tradable goods, on industries, what to do with them. We are still to come up with this. I would say that the ICP that India has set up is quite modern and almost all the facilities are available. And number one, number two, uh, this duty-free tariff preference scheme, this is unoperational because in reality on the ground, if Myanmar, if people from Myanmar or from India have to, you know, uh, export goods on uh, DPT, you know, direct tariff preference scheme on the ground because of non-tariff barriers, because of other non-tariff uh, taxes, you have to pay something like 35 Person taxes. Therefore, Myanmar's uh, duty-free uh, tariff preference scheme, it's not operational to them. So because of many of these problems, you see, normal trade is not going through over there. Okay. So therefore, I would say that we have to look for other means, other institutional means. And I would suggest, I'm looking at the watch, Gautam. So uh, <laughs> I would suggest two things. One, the border trade agreement was resigned by India unilaterally. That needs to be revived now. This is one. Number two, this free trade agreement. India has to negotiate a free trade agreement with Myanmar on bilateral terms. 
You see, these are realities. When India is away from the RCEP, India is now a little bit less interested in Asia because of deficits and so many things. It's time for Northeastern region and for Myanmar, especially on you know, the border you know, state, to think of a new border trade agreement, which is fair both to Myanmar and to Northeastern region. No one. Number two, we have to negotiate for a free trade agreement, a new free trade agreement, because I think this is what Niti Aayog thinks. What Niti Aayog is saying is that India has to revise all its free trade agreements. Okay, we have to revive it. It is the opportunity, opportunity time for uh, uh, India, for Northeastern India and Myanmar to think really of a new border trade agreement as well as a new free trade agreement. Lastly, the last point which you made, which is very pertinent. We may think there is no trade, but there is a huge amount of informal border trade. Why is it happening? To my opinion, as I have repeatedly said, it's because the traders on the ground prefer this informal trade. Why? Because of non-tariff barriers, because of high transaction costs. So if we do not bring about real institutional changes, new institutional changes and new economic narratives, which can be brought about, I think, by a border trade agreement or a free trade agreement, which should be renegotiated again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Prioranjan. I think very provocative as usual. Uh, I would have, uh, I wish we had the time to engage in a larger discussion. I think your last point on informal trade being preferred was also made by Dr. Myung Myung Min. Uh, but, you know, we are already at five and actually my hurry has nothing to do with uh, my willingness to continue, but I have another Zoom at about 5.15, so I have to sort of rush it a bit. Uh, Sabia, do we have a couple of, uh, enough time to uh, take in our two speakers, Dr. Palin and uh, uh, Mr. Shivchandra? In any case, we have to give them the floor. So Dr. Palin, I think now we can switch the focus to the services sector, particularly the extraordinary you know, services that you have been providing to uh, Western Myanmar. Dr. Palin, welcome. And, you know, just a, a quick word of introduction. He hardly needs any, but Dr. Palin is the founder and uh, director of the Shija Hospitals, uh, which has been a very prominent service provider in the health sector for uh, not only for Manipur, but also on the uh, Western side of uh, Myanmar. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, all the uh, participants. And uh, uh, I pay my gratitude uh, for allowing me to share my uh, experience, uh, particularly for Myanmar. Uh, I'm Dr. Palin, uh, basically I'm a plastic surgeon, and also I am uh, the partner surgeon of Smile Trend. Smile Trend is the NGO based in New York, USA. And with, uh, with this uh, partnership, I can operate uh, defect in the uh, lip, uh, this the lip and the palate, defect in the upper lip or the palate. Uh, free of course and uh, to the patient and uh, uh, the smile trend sponsor it and uh, regarding this uh, i can be called uh, uh, this uh, magic runner because i started my humble beginning as a mono practice now it is a 250 bedded uh, naba super specialty hospital supported by more than uh, uh, 1000 caregivers we have a nabl uh, accredited uh, blood bank NFL laboratory. We have the postgraduate courses in five departments and nursing college and paramedical institute. We have set a Guinness World Record for excising the largest neck tumor in the world. And uh, we do a clip and palate uh, more than 4,000 4, I have done uh, from Manipur and uh, neighboring states and uh, including the Myanmar. And uh, we focus in the medical tourism, kidney transplantation, coronary transplantation, joint replacement, uh, cardiac procedures, interventional, uh, this radiology, brain and spine, dental care, and cosmetic surgery. Just to set one example, uh, one kidney transplant is we have done a patient from Mandalay. Uh, they have gone to Bangkok and the budget was $80,000. And uh, ultimately they have heard about she's a hospital and we have closed, we have done it with 8,000 only. That means one tenth of the cost uh, from uh, Bangkok. And uh, also, uh, it is cheaper than any metros uh, in India also. Uh, that is the, the, the adv advantage. And uh, we are also uh, doing uh, some uh, part participation in uh, supporting the Japan. 
Uh, we have already uh, selected 13 nurses uh, recruited for the TIGP, Technical Intense Training Program. After uh, 10 months of training, uh, they have to, they have, they're supposed to go to Japan and work uh, there. But unfortunately, because of Corona, uh, their training is a little uh, delayed, uh, halted in between. And also we have selected uh, 19 nurses from Manipur, uh, especially from our hospital, uh, nursing college. Uh, for Sakra Hospital, Bangalore. Sakra uh, Hospital is uh, the Toyota sponsor uh, hospital in uh, uh, Bangalore. And in Manipur, we have uh, Central uh, Medical College and the State Medical College and dozens of uh, private medical colleges. And uh, one of them is uh, now focusing on cancer treatment. And this will be very, very in, uh, convenient for uh, uh, catering the services of uh, neighboring state and neighboring countries. Uh, I would like to specifically, I would like to mention about the CESA Mission Myanmar. Uh, it is a flagship program and we take it uh, very close to our heart. Uh, historically, Myanmar, we had uh, this uh, Manipur and Myanmar. They had a, a, a battle about 200 years back and Myanmar dominated Manipur uh, uh, for almost uh, seven years. After that, uh, they have gone and uh, the last 200 years, there is no proper uh, connectivity uh, with uh, Manipur and Myanmar, except for illegal trades, uh, other things. Uh, that also, the road was not very good, except uh, it was uh, created by the British during the Second World War. Because of its proximity and the connectivity, uh, say heart to heart and uh, people to people. So we have chosen this mission uh, Sagang, especially Sagang, uh, they don't have uh, uh, many uh, say doctors and more in Manipur and uh, the population of uh, many, po many pe people are suffering from uh, illness uh, in, uh, especially in Sagang and part of Mandalay is uh, Chin. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, mission Myanmar was uh, country to country relationship was uh, very much uh, influenced. It was a triangular effort in the public of uh, Myanmar, uh, Indian Consul General and she's a hospital. And uh, we have done a 339 in three phases of uh, free, uh, free surgery, including cataract surgery, keyhole surgery, and uh, uh, this uh, cleft lip and palate. And we conducted one health camp in uh, uh, Calais. Uh, we have seen uh, 2076, and we have trained uh, two surgeons and six nurses uh, free of course, it was endorsed by Association of Minimal Assist Surgeons of India. And uh, 2019 March, uh, Amasi Association of Minimal Assist Surgeons of India, led by Dr. Jagindra, uh, he is a, a president elect. He will be president from November. They have conducted a workshop in uh, Mandalay Medical College. 40 surgeons were trained. And uh, Manipur is now known for uh, healthcare. This is a very, very important. Uh, I think uh, the development uh, for the state of Manipur and uh, it is a goodwill ambassador between the two nations. And we have found uh, in the recent visit 2019, uh, 2018 January, uh, we have found that uh, 2 million population of Indian origin and Nepali origin stayed here. Many Buddhists wanted to go to Buddha Gaya and uh, they are reluctant to travel on surface. And uh, uh, air connectivity, we advised for, we wanted uh, the air connectivity, Yangon, Mandalay, and Kale with uh, this uh, uh, infall. We, ha we have observed, we have met uh, the minister of uh, Sagang and uh, the Mandalay. For Sagang, uh, we have found that uh, uh, this for 6 million population are in Sagang, only seven ophthalmologists. Out of that, three can operate for cataract. In Manipur, only 3 million but we have more than 40 uh, ophthalmologists and uh, uh, dozens of them can operate. So we can do a lot. So how many of them must be suffering from uh, uh, correctable or unavoidable uh, this, uh, needless blindness? So this is one area uh, we can uh, focus initially. And uh, since uh, 8 of August 2018, when uh, these uh, people can move across the, uh, the surface, we have seen 2,168 till uh, March before the lockdown. Uh, uh, Sir Provide said 600. No, it is not 600 till that. It is a 2,168 
out of which uh, we have operated uh, to, to 284, uh, including brain tumor, heart operation, and kidney transplant. The others are mainly uh, kidney, uh, other uh, stone diseases. And uh, we uh, proposed to the Chief Minister of Sagang particularly because uh, we felt that uh, Sagang, uh, there's a huge uh, requirement for health care because monthly day, we have seen a uh, lot of uh, other entry uh, from other countries for the healthcare. We have proposed for training of the doctors, nurses, paramedics, uh, CME program, eye care, vision center in multiple areas of Sagang, free cleft lip and palate surgery, bus service. And we would like to uh, say address uh, international hospital and more. Uh, integrated check posts, uh, they have been asked by the home ministry uh, how many uh, of uh, member uh, people are, are coming to entering the, the, the state of Manipur, India. Uh, yeah, there are many, but 70% of them are for healthcare reason. So they have suggested that why don't you provide land because the ICP has got 45 acres of land. So why not uh, provide land and the construct of hospital? Most of them are coming to our hospital. So we have uh, already spoken about this and connected and uh, let's see uh, how we progress. And uh, about the investment, yes, uh, huge international standard. We need a lot of uh, investment uh, from various uh, low cost investment. And also uh, most of the trade activities and healthcare uh, is happening in the uh, border of uh, the Myanmar and Manipur. And to facilitate this, uh, uh, we have already submitted application uh, for honorary consul general in Imphal. And uh, we have volunteer myself, uh, to be the, the honorary consul general because we, they don't need to spend uh, money for that. Uh, and uh, we need uh, services uh, for small, small things like uh, clearance for the kidney transplant. Is that we had to do, uh, of course, now uh, it is uh, not that long, but a lot of inconveniences sending to Calcutta or Delhi for the clearance and uh, for even trade. I think uh, this will help a lot. Uh, and uh, with these few words, uh, uh, I would like to conclude with a, one uh, very beautiful sentence that future belongs to those who believe in the beauties of their dreams. So uh, uh, it's uh, going to happen. Nobody can stop it because India and uh, Southeast Asia, this is uh, the only way. There's no alternative. Uh, so it will be connected uh, because of this COVID. Uh, it has been a little delayed, but things will be uh, better in, in the days to come. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Palin. Thank you for your very positive and upbeat uh, kind of uh, uh, intervention. Thank uh, you. I really appreciate it and really appreciate the work that you're doing in Manipur and in Myanmar. Um, our last speaker, and I'm sorry, we have Mr. Shivchandra Singh to keep you waiting so long, uh, is uh, Dr. R.K. Shivchandra. He is the convener of the Chief Minister of Manipur's special task force on Myanmar at the state level, and perhaps no better person than to conclude uh, this panel. I really regret that I have to leave midway through your uh, intervention because I have another uh, Zoom event that I'm programmed for. But so I, I, I like to leave my concluding remarks. I think Dr. Sabia uh, Dutta will take over and perhaps conclude uh, the session. But I'll listen to you as much as I can. Dr. Uh, R.K. Shikchan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, see Gautam Mukhrapadaiji. We had met in Yangon and we had conducted so many uh, seminars together. My respect to you and uh, my fellow panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, much area had been touched by eminent speakers earlier and I don't uh, have much to supplement. Uh, thank you very well, everybody that we have several rounds of seminars, workshops and all in context of India Myanmar relationship. It has been 20 years now we have been, uh, you know, conducting several rounds of uh, seminars and thank you everyone for taking active part in the uh, promotional activities of uh, ex policy as well as India Myanmar relationship. In fact, after World War II, Whenever we visit Moray, and whenever we have a glimpse of uh, 
Kabu Valley from the mountain top of Kuding Thavi, which is just a few kilometers ahead of Morey before reaching uh, the border town. We used to spend some few minutes there and we used to take the, enjoy the glimpse as far as I can touch and that is Kabo Valley. And the, the moment we see it, we always thought that we should explore something from Myanmar, which is our immediate neighbor. And a voice from within says that explore, go. And we believe that the Manipur is especially, our forefathers have told that one day the Eastern Gate will be opened and uh, there will be people to people connectivity as well. So uh, with that attempt, we have started an organization called the Indomiara Fraternal Alliance. I will try to brief as much as possible in 2004. And in between 2004 to 2020, we had several rounds of meeting. We had a kind of uh, interaction with our Myanmar counterpart in many areas, cultural accidents sports and so many activities uh, uh, we try to organize together <clears throat> hello so but uh, in 2017 the uh, scenario has been changed because as soon as mr birent our noble chief minister of manipur is he assumed the office as the chief minister of manipur i requested him that Take his policy is such a serious matter that you should uh, personally take part in that. With that concept, we had been to Yangon, where he took part in one of the international seminar on uh, uh, 2017 February 8, where he thundered from the podium that unless there is border opening, there is no deeper meaning of his policy. And sometimes uh, we have certain difficulties. That's what he said. And say between Nepal and the Tamu, we cannot go beyond Tamu, for example, in early days. And even if we go there also, we need to take a special permission. A special permission, we'll have to write to Nipido, we'll have to write to Yangon. And there is a long formalities that uh, we cannot easily consume it in few days. That was the difficulties earlier. So Manipur government in 2017, they set up a committee known as uh, Agnes Policy Committee Manipur, and for which uh, our chief minister is the chairman. And uh, there are many bureaucrats, including the chief secretary and the many uh, uh, principal secretaries, commissioners and all, and the members and the um, given the responsibility of the convener of the Agnes Policy Committee. See, when we talk about Agnes Policy and uh, when we talk of our problems in the border, Manipur being the immediate neighbor to Myanmar, we are to take part in their difficulties. We are to take part in many ways that is un unavoidable. But when it comes to the Agnes Policy Affairs Matters, the External Affairs Ministry, they are the direct responsibility. For example, in 2018, in February, a major fire was broke out in Tamu, Nafalo, where all the soaps in Nafalo were gutted to fire and was all vanished. It was raised to the ground. Honorable Chief Minister of Myanmar, Dr. Min Nang, and uh, his cabinet colleagues came down from Mongwa to take the stock of the situation. I also rise to this point. We really wanted to do our best in the reestablishment of the Nafalong town, which is very important for the Manipuris also. In one way, this is a lifeline for many Manipuris because there are many PT businessmen who are living on Nafalo market. We wanted to help, we wanted to extend maximum uh, uh, monetary help, but we can't do that. And even the city minister can't do that because it is central subject. Of course, some relief materials we could have uh, 
uh, extended, but in a big way, we couldn't do anything. But when it comes to Indo-Myanmar relationships, our gesture of love, our gesture of generosity, and our gesture of friendship, whether it is kind, it is kind or care, is very much needed, that we couldn't do much. So like, same thing, the gang division also, when they have a problem in the border, Nipi or Yangon is too far for them. In the same way, from Manipur Delhi also, it's a too far of land. Sometimes the gang government and some people, they have suggested to me that there should be uh, Northeastern, which, which is sharing border with Myanmar, should have a kind of cooperation or, or kind of union with the gang division and uh, Northeastern division, especially with the Manipur, with, with uh, which we have a direct link, which is also known as the Asian Corridor for India. It is very important. So <clears throat> now coming uh, back to the point, I will try to brief as much as possible. But in 2017, I'll tell you what happened is, in 2017, Manipur suffered about four months economic blockage. Manipur government has requested the central government to enable them to import this petrol and diesel from Myanmar. Center has simply turned it down because the fuel, uh, uh, the fuel, standard of Myanmar is not suitable for Indian automobiles. But unfortunately or personally what happened is many shops in Moray they used to sell these petrol and diesel in open and it is definitely this process from across the border. This is the importance of Myanmar to India as well as to the people of Manipur. So it is policy, Manipur government, though they have, uh, uh, they are not authorized. We are doing our best, the Manipur government especially, we are doing our best. The Chief Minister himself went to Yangon and he has invited the Chief Minister of Mandalay that he came. He has invited the Chief Minister of Zagang that he came with his football team where we had football exhibition match during uh, 2017 Shanghai Festival. And reciprocally, we had also been to Mongwa and uh, Mandalay to have a reciprocal football match of women 11 of Mandalay with women 11 of the gang and the Manipur women 11. And for a kind of information, Manipur is always considered to be the powerhouse of sports in many disciplines. And the Manipur football team, we have a special uh, uh, feeling to be proud of because out of the 11 women football team, nine or 10 happen to be from Manipur alone. So this is how we promote a kind of people to people connectivity. This is how we have uh, uh, developed uh, this people to uh, people to people relationship where we can see eyeball to eyeball and uh, start talking the uh, real language of ethics policy. This is very important. We have discussed so many things. Sometimes people from Delhi, people, people from South Block, they used to come down to Tanu and, uh, and they used to script the story of Actress policy, whereas they have not seen genuine river, whereas they cannot spell, spell out properly Kaliwa, Kalimu, where is Kasin, where is Muse, where is Masai, where is Mesot. Nobody knows it, but they are just sitting in a cozy restaurant in Tamu and they are trying to write big, big volumes of this policy behind their big volumes of books. I appreciate them. But in the last 20 years, since 2004, in between 2020, I have traveled to Myanmar many times. Sometimes without visa and passport as arranged by Ministry of Hotel and Tourism, sometimes with visa and passport and sometimes on multiple visa. So we tried many, many ways. Recently, we had introduced Indian uh, ball badminton, which was originated from India to Jagang. 
with the involvement of the His Excellency Dr. Min Nang, the Honorable Chief Minister of Jagang, where we have deputed two coaches and they have trained for about two months. They have come to Imphal, we have a, a you know, friendly kind of exhibition matches and all. Now, I will brief, uh, I don't, I, I, I'm not given much time. I will just come to the point, some suggestion I would like to put forth. Dr. Palin has uh, categorically stated that the importance of CJ Hospital and the adjoining hospital in Manipur. Yeah, very much, very right. I had been, I had accompanied with him many times to Myanmar, Dr. Igol, and uh, my respected Dr. Pierre and are all here. We have been together uh, with a concept to strengthen the bilateral ties of Myanmar and India in many ways. But to some extent, it has not been executed. Monthly Impal bus harvest, it is hung in India for so many years now. It is not implemented, I don't know why. 69 bridges from Tamu to Kaliwa. It is pending. It was the Work order was uh, awarded to a Mumbai farm, which is some thousand kilometers away from Manipur, which doesn't know, who doesn't know the ABC of Myanmar and Manipur. And they are, they subject all the works to different, different, different uh, subcontractors. But it's not the, it, it's not the way. The India government, especially with the request, should tap very serious attention and it should be awarded to a farm which can just execute the work in a stipulated time. Not that it gives to some Tom and the Harry and they, whether they execute the work or not, they, they just sleep on their pillow, it's not like that. I have spoken to the Chief Minister of uh, Mandalay, I have spoken to our Ambassador, former, and uh, Mr. Nandan Baishora and all, but and even the Zagang Division Chief Minister, he was so upset. He was not happy with the, with the kind of developmental works which has been taken up. It has not been implemented. When we talk of india Myanmar relationship, when we look from our border standpoint, we should think of that. We can also think that there is international border between China and Myanmar in the Sun State. And the, once upon a time, these areas. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Siva Chandra Singh. Sorry to in interrupt you. We have to actually wind up and uh, come to the very end. Maybe okay. we will have a bilateral with you later on. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, we have to go, and you know we have overshoot time by one hour. Your point is very well taken. One, so one, uh, one, just wind. kindly wind up in one minute, please. One minute. Okay. Thank you. So these are the obstacles we are facing here, and thank you very much. So uh, now what we need to do is that we need to invite all the people who are on the ground, and we need to work out what we can be done. And thank you. I will not take much more time than this. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, your points are excellent, well taken infrastructure at the border uh, between India and uh, Myanmar need to be strengthened. Oh, very, very well suggestion. So, but uh, let me, you know, we have come close uh, to the uh, discussion and we have uh, many points we have collected in the Q&A, but due to the lack of time, you know, it's not possible to answer all of them. Uh, but uh, uh, if anyone has any quick observation from the panel. You know, uh, you have seen the Q&A in the chat box, the questions that they have given. If anyone have a very quick response to the questions, uh, please uh, answer. I gave, you know. May I, uh, may I make a suggestion? Yeah. Uh, maybe we can request our collaborator, uh, Professor Tuta Ong, to see the questions and <clears throat> Uh, maybe address some of them at, to the panel, also make his closing remarks. Yeah, so so uh, if anyone has, before we go to, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Tuta, Professor Tuta, maybe from the panel, if anyone has any, any quick answers to the 
queries anybody has if not then i go to uh, straight to professor thuta to go for a you know closing remarks and uh, and we we leave it here dr thuta to you over to you of the day thank you and and so uh, thank thank uh, thank thank you for uh, uh, you know partnering with the mendeley forum and for for many of my colleagues here uh, man, many of you will remember me working with mysis Myanmar institute of strategic and international studies i'm still working with with mysis so as an introduction the mendeley forum for east asian studies this is the private sector involved think tank uh, in partnership between MISIS and Hamsa Hub. Uh, we intend to be more of an action-oriented you know, think and do tank. Uh, we, will, we, we have uh, several research that has come out with a focus on China. Uh, hence, you know, we are physically based in Mandalay rather than in, in Yangon. Uh, in terms of, you know, instead of summarizing all, instead of even trying to summarize uh, what the panel speakers have said because the the discussions were very detailed. Uh, the the takeaway points that I I would like to highlight, uh, which you know, uh, many of the speakers have, and and myself including, you know, I, I have this romanticized version of India Myanmar relationships. I'm sure our old friend. Dr. Tam Nye Wu has also highlighted the uh, the relationship, but in a more romantic way, historical way. Uh, but uh, my say, yeah, you know, uh, Dr. Myuta uh, mentioned about uh, the immediate actionable points, which which are really required if we want to uh, if we want to advance this conversation into reality. So the highlight the highlight the point that I like to you know focus is that. We have to move away from romance to reality. And how, how can we do that? As a partner to, um, to the Asian, Asian confluence and for the follow-up uh, event that we intend to host in the near future, uh, I, will, I will also like to invite, uh, of course, you know, the professors from India side, they are, we will be honored if they can join. Uh, but we would also like to see more PhD students and more uh, people on the field. Uh, and if they have action research projects that they wish to discuss and present, uh, that would be great. And in the meantime as well, um, I've also discussed with some of my staff uh, on you know something which many of the speakers have suggested on more Zagai and Manipur level uh, platform or projects where certain practical matters can be explored. So we can have n number of uh, forums, uh, I mean, seminars, and webinars like this. But uh, they may never, you know, they, they may not lead to some immediate actions. Of course, you know, I'm I'm an I'm an optimist. Uh, there would still be things that we can achieve. Uh, without the, of course, the infrastructure is great. Uh, like, you know, we just lost the electricity. So the, we can all be thinking of all the great things, but uh, the, the infrastructure problems exist in Myanmar. And even, even with that, uh, I, I, I'm still confident that uh, we can advance uh, Brahmaputra and Erawadi uh, collaboration. If we can find actionable areas where we can collaborate and involve people from different levels. So uh, the, the, Dr. D is very busy, I'm, uh, but uh, well, some of your students might have time to be on the field to experiment with stuff, right? Uh, to create a website. There are so many techie, uh, techies in, uh, in India. Uh, Myanmar can benefit from those techies. In fact, you know, my office is uh, a stone throw away from MIT, which is the example of successful India-Myanmar collaboration, the, you know, the IT university. So uh, if, we can chunk, if we can chunk these things down to more actionable points, I, I believe you know, we can, uh, three, four years down the line, uh, I, 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 uh, you know, we, we, uh, the people will say, "Oh, you know, these conversations have led to certain projects." And and with that, I would like to close that uh, as a 
it's, it's an honor to be a partner to the Asian Confluence and other um, in their prestigious organizations. Uh, I will be happy to uh, deploy every resource that's available to my, uh, to my institute uh, to be able to make this collaboration a success. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tuta, and an excellent collaboration. And uh, thank you very much, all the panelists, it is one hour time, Myanmar time, Myanmar time is ahead of us. Some of you might be a dinner time for you. So, and we have been sitting on the webinar for three to three and a half hours continuously. Uh, but despite that, you know, we, 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 several constraints, we presented excellent views individually and also professionally I have gained. I thank uh, our secretaries who came in the, in the, in the first panel Governor, Dr. Nazbah Patullah, ambassadors from both the countries, member of parliament, and what they said, uh, almost everything being discussed, even uh, you know, in the panel, we could draw the, the new points because I have been following up Myanmar in ASEAN context. So with the presentation by Ono Jawasan, with the opening remarks in the second panel, by Ambassador Mukhopadhyay, and then followed by discussion by Dr. Mio Fan, Dr. Zhou, Dr. Mio Mio Mint, and then our expert stellar panel from the Myanmar, uh, and also from the Manipur, Dr. Palin, uh, Dr. Uh, Ibohal Mete, Dr. Priyoranjan, uh, and uh, Siva Chandra Singh. Um, who is the active uh, ambassador probably from the Manipur. So thank you very much uh, for uh, joining today's uh, panel discussion. This is just the beginning. And as Professor Suta said, we'll be had uh, many more. We will be coming up with a summary. I think Sabha Sachi, you will also agree with me that this summary, today's discussion, as we do all the time, you know, uh, we do a webinar and follow up summary. We share with our stakeholders. This will also be shared with panelists, the, the attendees, and you know the people who are there in the government and many, many places. So thank you and have a great weekend and enjoy uh, your weekend. And uh, please keep in touch, stay healthy and take care. Thank you very much.